Alrighty, welcome to our weekly discussion. This one is about Steven Pinker's The Blank Slate. And uh, every week we do these discussions about different uh, philosophy concepts, I guess, or just general things in the Beverly community, which is a community set up, or should I say cooperative now, uh, set up for trying to better ourselves through personal wisdom. We're still working on that intro. But yeah, I'm joined here today by John Nata, and I'll let the new person introduce themselves if they wish to. I uh, don't want to violate anyone's privacy. So um, yeah, I, we can probably jump straight in. Oh, actually, let me open up the agenda. Gosh, I need to get better at these intros with the new change of everything. So okay, let me share just some new things for the updates of the community. Uh, of Beverly, and then we'll kick it off to the actual discussion about the blank slate. So just give me a few minutes. So this is the agenda for the meeting. You can get the join link in the description below. If you feel we're saying anything egregious, please jump in and correct us, um, or you know give us better feedback. So I added a new area in the Beverly forum for digital nomads, including uh, tax residency and citizenship. So this is, you know, if you're a digital nomad, you need to be aware of what your tax obligations are. And also maybe you'll be more willing to migrate to a country that is more facilitating of your own uh, ethos and telos. Then we also have a new contracts and legal section, which will go over the contracts and like employment issues uh, across different states. And also if you are a remote work in the knowledge workspace, um, confidentiality or IP agreements, as well as say patent agreements and whatnot, and what's kind of the state of everything in that area. So that's kind of the only new thing from the group. Actually, no, sorry, we have a very important project we need to give a shout out to. So Jen is, Jenny is a student photographer based in London. She's looking to photograph some studio portraits of Jordan B. Peterson fans and followers in order to learn more about the benefits that individuals get from following his structured lifestyle, as well as his mass appeal. If you would like to be a subject or want to know more, please email the email address that is shown. Any photo subjects must be able to be get to central London and be over 18. So she's done like a type of work of this before. Here's a little image. Of kind of the stuff so she's want to kind of do the same of the Peterson community uh, so that should be quite interesting if anyone's in London uh, post back and, and kind of help her out so other than that yeah we don't have anything particularly new besides in the practice community I bought a bunch of monitors so I shared all my research for that and I also got um, some smart notebooks that finally arrived so you can like have notebooks that you can raise things on so you buy one notebook and then use it for the rest of your life because it's erasable. It's amazing. Um, other than that, yeah, nothing new in the, yeah, so that's it. So this discussion follows on. So we read The Rape of Nanking a while ago, um, and that was quite horrifying that people could do that. So then we followed that up with The Natural History of Rape, which was last week's discussion, and we then decided, hey, we should also read critiques. Uh, to a natural history of rape, which seemed to go a bit more on the biological determinism, the nature determinism route. Uh, so blank slate, we read that, and um, you know to kind of do that one as well as schedule the adaptive mind uh, book for next week, which we'll be discussing. And I've tacked on a new book that I'll uh, add on. Uh, I haven't announced it anywhere yet, but we will add it on. So it's a book about more social selection pressures, which the natural history of rape people completely rejected. But there's a growing amount of evolutionary biologists or sociologists who are going along the social selection route, uh, or specifically multi-level evolutionary selection. So that's kind of doing what the blank slate did in 2003 to the modern evolutionary discussion of today. So let me stop sharing the screen then. Uh, yep, and we'll go into the discussion. So uh, we'll so scroll over on. the, yep. Did you, it, it's, I don't see how the blank slate was supposed to be some sort of like critique or refutation of Thornhill and Palmer's work. It seems like uh, Pinker went out to, like, the point of the book is to go against the uh, 
common kind of liberal conception that every person is a blank slate. And this is this, like the title is kind of ironic or, or uh, that's focusing on that subject in order to disprove that thesis, which was never really part of the uh, Thornhill and Palmer uh, uh, conception at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's good you raised that because I, I kind of glossed over that. So, yeah, the, the subtitle of The Blank Slate is The Modern Denial of Human Nature. Uh, so it kind of specifically focused. So, again, it's crazy that the book was written in 2003. And it's also crazy that the antics it talks about, such as noisemakers and lectures, were also uh, prevalent in the 70s, which is baffles me because... We still see it today in university uh, lectures where people use noisemakers as a debating tactic. Um, <laughs> well, not so much a debating tactic, more like a lack of debating tactic. Um, so the yeah, so that is correct. Like, um, but I felt from our discussion last week, right? Like the critique against um, the a natural history of rape was that it did seem to lean too much on individual evolution as individual selection uh which seemed to deny cultural impacts to an extent even though it had like a whole last third of it dedicated towards what are cultural things we can do to uh to reduce rapes occurrences in society um, however, the critique against that was, in large part, hey, you're you're not taking into account social selection um, or other or cultural things or these other bits. And they did a very good job. Like that book was amazing. I gave it five out of five to Natural History of Rape. Um, maybe four out of five. I can't particularly remember, but it was it was astounding. Um, the type of theories it produced and how well it argued it, with the exception of that first. Uh, first chapter, which was quite hard to to get through, um, but this one. So I, I raised this one in terms of like it kind of took their stuff, but you know to some extent I guess it was critical, and some extent it wasn't critical because this was meant to be like the bridge builder, I guess, right? Like the bridge building between the the blank slaters versus the uh, what what did the cover say again? the human nature uh, proponents, right? And and so I think it maybe in that extent they were kind of Pinker's role was to critique the straw man that was proposed from the natural history of rape rather than the natural history of rape itself, at least from this book, because uh, the book next week will certainly be criticizing this book uh, Blank Slate by Stephen Pinker, as well as Natural History of Rape, uh, which is the Adapting Minds book. That one is purely a, at least from my perspective, that one's purely on the social selection and no individual selection route. So we'll see how that one goes. Um, so like society and culturally implanted ideas within people. I'd say also yeah. like um, there's another book that I really love. It's uh, uh, Don't Shoot. The dog, which is all about uh, behavioral training, but it, it kind of has this uh, a, a similar approach, like taking after B.F. Skinner, where all actions are um, whatever is kind of uh, reinforced within that animal or organism's life is what then builds up its kind of model for the world and how it acts within it. So, like that. That's how B.F. Skinner was the guy that could train like ping, uh, uh, pigeons to play ping pong, which is something that would be completely unnatural to a, an environment uh, and an evolutionary background or anything like that. But still by using reinforcement training so that like causing the, the animal to cr have positive associations with the action that you're trying to train into them, that is um, how he was able to get the, these animals to do these types of things. Um, so uh, the, if we wanted to go into a more so sociocultural um, blank slate, I guess, idea, that something akin to B.F. Skinner or people uh, like him. I think Piaget is a bit of a social social construction of it. 
social constructivist as well. So that might be interesting, I guess, side homework or something. Yeah. So I think maybe to explain why the book's important, first we need to talk about the structure of the book or what the book's actually arguing, right? Because it's hedged on three concepts and one of them is even in the book's title. So it's there's three concepts that it uh, introduces, which is the blank slate. Uh, the other one is the noble savage, and the other one is the ghost of the machine. And it argues how these three concepts have kind of made their way into society from previous philosophers before. Uh, that was from the first part of the book. That was uh, really interesting. Um, the role that you know a few philosophers from a few hundred years ago have really made an impact on the way that society is structured for centuries and then how these beliefs have been used politically uh, and I guess through that hot buttons area so it's been used politically violently through gender through children through the arts and also there's kind of several fears that posits as those which are holding on to those beliefs which is inequality imperfect imperfectibility, the fear of determinism, and the fear of nihilism. So those things are kind of drawing these beliefs. So what are those beliefs, which is the blank slate, noble savage, and the ghost machine? So the blank slate is then to say that, um, oh, what did I, where's my little review? Because I, I thumbed-rived it a little bit better in that review that I posted. Um, sorry, everybody. Just give me 10 seconds. I should also probably add that I have not read all of the blank slate. I right. got through about, I don't know, how, how many pages exactly, but about three hours worth. And I, 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 I just think that the book is probably not at all aimed towards myself as an audience. Like, it seems like this book is primarily for people that might have been under the assumption that people have no intrinsic nature behind them and that they are a blank slate. And this is kind of a book aimed towards changing their view on that. So I don't know, there wasn't much I was really getting out of it. So yeah. Yeah. So that, that touches. So the blank slate, as John kind of uh, said, there is, it's the idea of nurture determinism so that we're all, uh, completely blank pieces of paper and then culture or social factors or invite I don't think they even consider environment besides that which is social uh, as what is implants our nature so our nature is derived from the social environment and to some extent you see the extreme cases of this with Leninism uh, in Soviet Russia where they believe that if you treated for instance a grain of uh, wheat as a grain of uh, like a, an apple seed then you will grow an apple tree <laughs> you know, in from a grain of wheat as long as you treated it as it was an apple tree um, and that was one of the many factors that led to Soviet Russia starving um, but in with humans it's that's more used to I mean, there's there's reasons for it, and the reason to kind of why they kind of compound to each other. So the reason why like nurture determinism creates nature, uh, the reason why that's desirable is then compounded by the notion of a noble savage that nature is pure. So nature is this pure blank slate where there is no harm, there is no torture, there is no rape, there is you know, nothing, all those things then come from culture because culture is what writes on that blank piece of paper. So culture that can either write things well or it can write things poorly. Uh, and because of that, then we're not re kind of... For the repercussions of that, then we'll touch on that after we've explained these these concepts. So the next concept then is the... Uh, the ghost in the machine, which is the idea of sentience as something that can overrule our nature. So even if we did have, um, and this one was really where Pinker did shine in the book. I was a bit overly critical in my private chats, but this one is where Pinker did uh, shine because Pinker 
uh, by profession, studies language development in children. And in doing so, then he's had to come familiar with the mental uh, capacities, the brain capacities and the brain structures required for language. So he argued very well that, for instance, to learn language, the reason why humans learn it better than chimps learn it isn't due to exposure to language. It's due to, it seems that we have natural building blocks built within our brain for picking up certain grammatical instincts, which is why language comes easier to humans, but something newer such as writing literacy is very hard for humans. And that's why he argues that's the role of education to teach us things that don't come intuitively. So, and that's, that's quite a, Maybe I'm going to change my thoughts on this book quite a bit as I review it with a more calm-headed mind. Um, but, yeah, so that that's quite interesting. So when you tie these things together uh, and you talk into about the fears, so I think, did I explain those concepts well? And we can talk about the repercussions from those concepts uh, What was the now? third concept? The ghost the in the machine. So we can see this uh, elaborated with with modern artificial intelligence uh, proponents or, you know, that AI will eventually become sentient, like with a singularity. Um, it's like the idea of the matrix type AIs, which still interface with us, like the myths, the myths on this equal level or equal capacity. Whereas there's the idea that there's machines and then there's this ghost put inside them. And that can be considered, he argued, originates with the origins of a soul which is we have these bodies and then these souls are kind of implanted into them that control these bodies rather than the bodies particularly controlling the the soul uh so yeah, he gave kind of the, the uh descartes i think therefore i am yeah placing and all actually, of the control on the the i the conscious awareness and then from that the conscious awareness is capable of changing or uh, the conscious I person is the one moving the controls for the person, the actual body that you exist. In. That's the ghost in the machine kind of conception. Yeah. And, and it, so even Descartes, like uh, one of the things that struck me was how wide red Pinker was. He included quotes from pretty much everything uh, <laughs> and, and did a, did his best to summarize them all. Um, and, build them build them in cohesively so even mention like for Descartes Descartes believed that um, like the consciousness was a thing in of itself and that even despite damage to the body the soul remains completely intact um, in which case Pinker then says well you know if you wipe out one hemisphere then the other hemisphere can kind of uh, facilitate the same functions. However, if you wipe out the same structures on both hemispheres, then the person will now have issues. And when it specifically relates to, so, you know, you can wipe out someone's vision, does that affect the soul, right? However, you know, that's a very easy, you know, one to have, you know, contention over. But if you wipe out other parts, such as things more related to decision making, then someone can become violent or aggressive or, you know, lose more traits of virtue. And in which case, wait, how do you then rectify that as they still have the soul intact when their actual behavior and their identity and their beliefs start changing? In which case, it's hard to then say that the soul remains intact despite the body. So the argument there is, you know, brought forth through a lot of neuroscience that the brain and the biological mechanisms such as you know even more body focused ones such as hormones or phantom limbs and other things impact the brain's conception of itself and impacts the soul's conception of itself so in that regard um there's kind of this feedback loop between the two where they're influencing each other and he takes a very staunch case against any type of soul where it is once you're dead you're dead um in the book and which still seems a little bit arrogant because it's still then asserting that you know things that you don't that it's to say i know what i don't yet know <laughs> right i because you know it could always be that there's some other thing that we haven't yet discovered that answers that but again 
if it hasn't been proven yet, then we uh, we can't operate or predict on that. However, it doesn't mean that we should have the audacity to discredit uh, that. We can discredit things we know that are untrue, but it's very hard to discredit things we don't know that are that we think is untrue. <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the ghost. Of yeah, so The Ghost in the Machine, uh, it was actually surprising when he mentioned that because there's an anime series, a uh, series of movies called The Ghost in the Machine. Um, and they recently got remade by Hollywood with Scarlett Johansson. Um, I haven't seen the remake, but I saw the original. So that the originals were, there was these AIs um, who kind of operated as a police force. And then they had, you know, as the cases got more complex that they were investigating, uh, there was, you know, an AI police officer would be partnered with a human police officer, and then they would have to reason about the cases um, differently. And then it kind of, the movie was kind of orchestrated to kind of show the similarities that could arise from such thinking when complexities in cases were introduced. Um, and then how a type of conscience, uh, not just consciousness, but a type of conscience can then start arising uh, between uh, once that complexity is then required, then something can break out of the traditional program beliefs, which seems maybe what also happened with humans, which is as the environment gets more complex, we need natural ways of dealing with that complexity. So we spawn more general adaptions um, that can deal with that overwhelming uh complexity but so specifically speaking in regards to uh the political actions or the fears maybe we can talk about the fears that drive that and then talk about how they're using politically um so the fears kind of behind them like why would you want to believe in the blank slate why would you want to believe in the noble savage why would you want to believe in the ghost in the machine that the soul drives the human body well P pinker argues that it's due to a fear of inequality a fear of imperfectibility and a fear of determinism and a fear of nihilism so a fear of inequality can arise by saying like you know the statement that men and women are different uh, is incredibly triggering to a large portion of, I would say, progressive USA, especially on coastal cities, <laughs> um, and especially in the tech world, um, and in and also in feminist circles, probably around the world. Actually, no, definitely not around the world. Uh, it's probably specifically more in Western countries because around the world they just seem more. Uh, they actually. Gender theory has not taken off outside of the West um, at all. So, yeah, probably mm -hmm. that would be an interesting book to read. Why hasn't gender theory taken off outside the West? Um, it's probably because they don't have the ideological footholds for it to. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, so the... Uh, sorry, if I'm doing sorry, weird I'm facial expressions, it's because it's 5 a.m. I did get more sleep this time, but just uh, yeah, help me out when when I need it. Uh, so yeah, so the fear of inequality can be um, like expressed by okay, if men and women are different. So the rape book is a great example of that, which is uh, the natural history of rape argued that there is evolutionary strategies for why. Sorry, I shouldn't say that was my take on that book, which it didn't particularly do. Its specific take was that there is evolutionary adaptions in sexual selection strategies between men and women that are different related to the biological necessities of different costs associated to evolution. John, I'm getting feedback from your microphone. Or, yeah. um, and one of those byproducts that it argues is rape uh, in men. Uh, it didn't make the argument that that was an adaption because it seemed to not have found a reason where that was adaptive uh, it argued that females uh, the female selection strategy optimizes around resources uh, as well as optimizes for better child outcomes given those resources 
whereas the met whereas rate violates that by just putting complete you know there is no resource obligation uh, from the male it is completely on the female and that cost is very high not through pregnancy and the and the lively um, the effect to the female anatomy but also through the upbringing required over 20 years or so of fostering that child uh, so the costs are much higher whereas for the rapist it was you know a horrific act and and that and that's kind of it whereas and that's also they argue explains the psychological trauma that women experience which is it's such a violation of their ability to select the outcomes of their reproductive costs um, and especially the side effects of that in terms of marriage is quite high because um, it can lead to high divorce if it's hard to prove the rape um, and whatnot, which is then why women are incentivized to show, a, uh, you know, some type of resistance against the rapist. Uh, okay, so, so that that's really helpful for me in getting a better or uh, more clear understanding of their case in, in that book because I, I don't know, it, it was still quite vague for me in uh, whether they were are making the case that rape was adaptive uh, in our evolutionary history, or if this was merely a byproduct that uh, occurs uh, similar to no. the other byproducts that we have of evolutionary history, like uh, addiction to sugar and things like that. Um, but yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, I, they, they do go into how certain species do, do have evidence for there being uh, adaptations for the uh, rape strategy within yeah uh, so like uh, the water strider was one where there's like a specific gripping thing for for gripping onto the female in order to copulate uh, I think yeah. also with like penguin or not penguins but uh ducks as well there's quite a few series of adaptations that take place both in the male genitalia and the female genitalia but it seems yeah. like for for them the, these adaptations have taken place due to uh, the the individual selection pressures to manifest those outcomes as desirable. Yeah. But that, um, that, so, that's really interesting what you brought up for with female selection. There is a, a a good degree of uh, resource consideration as to like which males have a higher amount of resources and are going to be more capable or not of protecting uh, a woman during their time of vulnerability. And so if the, if the sexual strategy of uh, spray and pray, uh, as you went into it uh, last week, uh, if that strategy was put into effect, there would be no, uh, there would be no protectorate for the, the woman in her time of pregnancy. And thus it, it could be a, a much more dangerous process to go through uh, for the woman and, and would likely not be uh, adaptive for the child uh, of a rapist who put, went through that strategy. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the, well, the book argued it uh, from so many angles about very, like it, so the thing about that book was it gave really good predictive accuracy of you know their their theory of uh, using evolutionary perspective to look upon that problem created accurate predictions, um, and by creating accurate predictions, then it gives you abilities to act in ways to dissuade it uh, effectively. Uh, whereas if you're not using theories that provide accurate predictions, then you're not going to create effective actions uh, at a social level. So for instance, one of the, uh, so it argues like, it's really quite interesting, like how much then they say, like say for instance, cultural adaptions then to then sort out uh, the issue of rape uh, within human society. So some of those adaptions would be uh, monogamy as one because a female accompanied at all times either through other females or through a husband greatly reduces the female uh, chance of rape as well as more conservative dress styles and they argue 
a whole a range of things. It was incredibly insightful. It's just like so much of human sexual behavior, as well as decision making around sexual slave behavior. Because again, from an individual selectionist perspective, then sexual selection is uh, evolutionary selection. So everything, uh, uh, if one believes in individual selection, comes down to sexual selection. Pretty much every single thing guided in your life is related to that ultimate cause. <laughs> so, as not well to as see... natural environmental selections. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think I overstated that, Nata, or, or are you agreeing? Well, I'm I'm disagreeing because I I don't think that they have like individual that individual perspective that you seem to think they have. Okay. Because like they, yeah. So, yeah. Perhaps that's a longer discussion for us because we're discussing well, the blank slate now. But yeah, but yeah, yeah. I I think um, yeah. I I didn't really uh, understand why you, you interpreted it uh, that way because I didn't. Uh, yeah, I was because they, they also like. That. Yeah, well, it's because they ruled out like the I. Th so this is why they argued. I think why, even though rape was a adaptive strategy in other animals it was an adaptive strategy in humans because in humans they couldn't find um anything from a uh because if you just hold on to individual selection then there there showcases the evidence of rape being incredibly catastrophic to child outcomes uh within humans then showed them or was ever because they actually argued is rape an adaptation in the book, and then the evidence against rape being an adaptation was it causes mm -hmm. worse outcomes, um, things like that. It causes you know less investment from uh, paternal figures, uh, so you know cupped uh, step parents. In that case would be an unknown step parent or whatever, right? So you know a husband and wife, the wife gets raped, uh, you know then there's loss of resources, and you know that could lead to divorce. And it, so they just kind of cited all these bad uh, reasons for rape as in the argument against it. And whereas if they were, and they also specifically rejected things like memes um, in the first third of the book, whereas if they were to adopt uh, or incorporate social selection uh, perspective in the book, then then the cases become a lot and I, this was the same interpretation that I got from this book, which was that he didn't particular uh, Pinker didn't argue uh, social selection uh, either. Uh, and it seems, um, but again, social selection has only really like besides Dawkins' memes, uh, it's really only being propagated by a few people in the last fifteen years or so when that theory is getting more and more grounds for belief. Whereas, so is uh, is it the same as like cultural uh, evolution or? Yeah, well, so one of so one of the things with these two books is they spend a long part arguing about what they're not saying. For instance, they're not saying that individual selection will lead to different a uh, race division, and the race division wouldn't be adapted to certain things. They still argue throughout all books that races are equal. And um, because if they were to adopt social selection, then they can't, it becomes harder for them to then say that races are equal. Because I think then it's usually it would, referred to as group selection rather than yeah. social selection. Okay. Well, it depends, okay. yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah, so there's multi-level select. So with multi-level mm -hmm. selection, then it there's many different areas. So there's like the gene as like the, so gene would be one level of selection, then individual another level of selection. Group would be another, but then how do you define group? Then social, cultural, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas, uh, pardon? No, no, that, that, that's fair. Because uh, like it used to, uh, a lot of, arguments made prior to Dawkins, or I don't know if it was, but, but in the early stages of uh, evolutionary uh, hypotheses, there was people arguing that all adaptations were done for the good of the group, and like in order to justify uh, their 
their group in in comparison to other groups. Uh, mm -hmm. And then later on, it kind of like Dawkins popularized such as the, like nationalism the, or genocide from the world yes. from like the Nazi, yeah, the right wing, colonialism, and all, all of those different things as well. So, uh, and then with uh, the more specific gene selection uh, as popularized by Dawkins, that kind of went into power uh, in, into cultural acceptance. And then, yeah, now recently, group selection has kind of come back under the new understanding uh, as put forward, I think primarily by David Sloan Wilson, but also he's got like people like uh, Edward O. Wilson and also uh, Jonathan Haidt as well, partially, uh, who go into multi-level selection, where fully accepting kind of Dawkins' selfish gene understanding with the further understanding that adaptations do take place on the cultural level um for that aren't adaptations made for the gene itself but rather for that gene in its interactions with um the other individuals of the group that it, it exists within and, and so uh rather than these adaptations being memes that are like promulgating themselves within the minds the mindosphere as Dokken puts it uh, of these different individuals. These memes are actually uh, adaptations that have taken place due to, or, or adaptations that, it, maybe not adaptations, but mutations, let's say, like cultural mutations that take place um, for the group itself to survive. And because if there are groups that exist in, uh, exist in, in themselves that are is better for all the individuals within the group than other groups which are more cat catastrophic and unable to interact with each other properly for other reasons or like that are less evolutionarily fit and so adaptations will take place or there there will be the group level adaptations as well as the uh selfish gene level adaptations that also take place depending upon the environment that's selecting for groups that are, say, more altruistic or groups that are less altruistic towards other groups. That, that's the multi-selection theory as far as I understand it from uh, Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind. Yeah. Because, so, for instance, individual selection, it's, it's completely ineffective at explaining suicide or adoption or whatnot because they're against individual interests so the individual selectionists they're like kind of at war at the groups with the group selectionists because the individual selectionists kind of believe that all group phenomena is all a result of individual evolutionary adaptions or byproducts um, yeah so the whereas, means being byproducts then for yeah Whereas the group selection people then say, well, no, it can also be, well, it also depends how black and white they want to go about it. But with multi-level, then they're saying, well, it's a bit of all of them, which is to say that, well, the individual selection is also at will to the social uh, selection or the group selection, which is to say that uh, with the memes or, or at group selection at the gene level, then it can explain suicide as something that protects the tribe from wasted resources in times. And so, for instance, an individual serotonin uh, is correlated to the group output or the group demand or the capacity. So if it drops, then depression ensues. And if it can't be, that's first a psychological call to then reinvigorate themselves as useful to the group. But then if that fails, then suicide is the output. Uh, in which case then, you know, the roots limited resources within the group are now constrained to those which is producing um, uh, group cohesion. Um, so that's yeah. kind of going into like what Peterson talks about with the uh, uh, downgraded lobsters in Twelve yeah. Rules for Life, where, uh, where you are in the social hierarchy is like how important you are towards the social unit that you or the for the group that you 
or the hierarchy that you organize yourself according to, uh, which I guess would be the hierarchy primarily based upon female mates status or like, uh, like the, the hierarchy takes place and then women are attracted to those higher up in the hierarchy. Uh, and then not towards those and, and the people like the men that are competing within that hierarchy also elevate the other men that are more beneficial towards the group. Yeah. So, so okay. the, yeah. So it's also pretty much comes down to their fears as well as their desires or also where the research shows what is adaptive versus a byproduct. So for instance, an individual selectionist would argue that suicide is a byproduct or that adoption is a byproduct rather than these things being adaptive strategies at the social unit. Um, because, and it seems this is driven by like a fear not to be associated with Nazi, Nazism, <laughs> uh, yeah. which was probably a much bigger fear uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s and the noughts. Whereas yeah. in the last 10 years, it's I think there's been more of a uh, more demand considering the alt-right to be able to give good arguments to them. So now that you know, people are more receptive to kind of engaging in those arguments to be able to actively argue against the alt-right, because mm -hmm. otherwise the alt-right are going to march onwards with arguments that people are too afraid to argue. Now there is also the, I guess you could call it middle of the road uh, theory as well, that's kind of put forward or at least popularized by uh, Brett Weinstein, which I think is kind of a variation to uh, Dawkins' uh, gene selection, but it, it's referred to, I, I believe, as lineage selection. So where uh, uh, behaviors such as like suicide or uh, school shootings or, or other things that we would see as uh, obviously not advantageous for the individual uh, those could be explained through lineage selection in regards to uh, or by showing how this suicide takes place for the greater benefit of the uh, genetic heirs of that person. So like even if you haven't had any like uh, which is where like Brett Weinstein make warns us that like things like nationalism and racism are evolutionarily embedded within us. Whereas from Dawkins kind of more, uh, I guess, worried some perspective say, says that these are only memes that have propagated within themselves, kind of like the blank slate conception that all hatred is learned. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, it also should be worth while the memes wasn't in the original edition of Selfish Gene. It was added in the revised edition like 30 years later. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think in the original one, it was just like a little quip, like a one paragraph mark yeah. of like, this would be interesting. <laughs> and then 30 years later, it's just like, oh, this was actually really interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh I'm kind of curious um, myself on folks' thoughts around how uh, companies can propagate memes that can potentially impact genes. Um, and I, I want to share something from the book that I got from uh, a summary. It says, uh, and this is in the Ghost in the Machine portion. However, even this division fails to explain why separated twins often grow to prefer the same brand of cigarettes. Now, the relationship that I'm curious in here, and I, I just looked up the relationship between uh, 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 people abusing others and smoking, because my previous research has indicated that when you smoke nicotine, it impacts the, the frontal lobe, and people with an impacted frontal lobe don't make good as, uh, decisions. So. Um, I'm seeing research indicating that those that uh, have been abused as a child are more likely to smoke. And furthermore, those who smoke 
um, are more likely to have their frontal lobe or their decision-making part of the brain impacted, which can then, which can then propagate, as I start to look even further in the book, with the fear of Im imperfect ability, is that um, the fear is that if it comes naturally for someone to rape someone, then by which measures have we decided that this individual is fit for jail? Well, uh, Pinker thinks that if something is natural, it doesn't mean that it's good or that it must be tolerated. But how do we, like, as a species, how do we factor in the, the, the memes companies that are propagating in ignorance in order to buy their products, which are perpetually uh, impacting the body? Because we, we're trying to debate, does the mind sit, does the body sit as a layer around the mind and you can control it? Or is the mind seated inside the body? And I'm I'm kind of curious to hear your your guys' thoughts around some of these uh some of these uh perplexions that I'm that I'm having between genes and, and memes and uh and uh, the, the the companies out there and how they're using them. Yeah. Anyone want to go first? Otherwise, I'll 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 keep going to the cows go home. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I I don't know. I I do kind of have. I guess more affinity towards the Nietzschean conception that the mind and all of its thoughts are kind of extensions of the, the organism itself, which is also, I, I think there's a way to read Dawkins' um, extended phenotypes. Like all memes are in fact actually extended phenotypes for the organism, which I, I think is uh, an, an interesting way of, uh, I don't know, that, that's kind of where, I, I, I've been kind of thinking lately uh, with that about that. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing that. Just uh, but before you get a chance, Benjamin, I just mm -hmm. want to let you know I, I, I agree with where you're coming from. I, I, I feel like inherently the mind is what's driving uh, the, the, the physical reality. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of kind of curious as to how somebody would be able to validate uh, a gut feeling like that. But I, I do appreciate the call out for the extended phenotype and I will research that further. Yeah. Isn't that the, uh, the book by John J.F. J.F. Gatsby? Gatsby? Well, the extended phenotype was something that Dawkins brings up in The Selfish Gene. And then I think he also wrote another uh, book exploring that even further but it, it, it's essentially uh, his argument was that there are certain uh genes with with in the organism that are associated with actions for that organism to the right. point where the actions themselves could be considered a manifestation of or or not a, really yeah the actions themselves are a manifestation of the the gene itself so similar to how our eyes like aren't technically our eye color is not technically a uh, directly selected for by or it's not it's not directly linked to the gene itself, but is kind of a further process that the actions that an organism plays is also uh, yeah and it. it and extended version of the, the genes themselves so, so that it, for the, the presumed protection of the uh, lineage or, or the, the gene to be selected for into the future I, but I don't know this is much further outside my uh, ability to uh, go into further I guess right I, I found the book by JF it's uh the revolutionary phenotype, so not the extended right. phenotype, the revolutionary yeah, I think he, uh, he follows uh, Dawkins somewhat, but I haven't yeah. really listened to much of him. Well, JF, by trade and expertise, like he's a doctor in evolutionary biology, I think. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so what you said, Octavian, I'm using your name because it popped up down below, so everyone's going to know. Oh, no, no, it's totally fine. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So the, um, so for that, so one of the other things that the book said, just to uh, elaborate or illustrate the argument, is that 
identical twins also tend to also wear, like say for instance, if one identical twin wore a rubber band on one of their wrists as you know a lifestyle choice or whatever, then the other identical twin is likely to do that, even if they were reared apart. Even if they were reared apart, they're more likely to prefer the same color and whatnot. So, well, how do you explain that? Um, and well, one's personality is very heritable, which is to say that there is a genetic component to it or a biological component to it, which extent is biological or environment, you know, genetic is, is to be determined, right? So by biological there, I'm saying more than just the genes. So it could be the role in vitro, so in uh, as a fetus or as well in early uh, environmental cues that affect the biology, but it's still largely something heritable to the person rather than the soul, you would say. And so in that extent, there's a large aspect of personality, but then why would there be personality? So Peterson showed um, that personality predicts politics in part of his academic research. Uh, for personality being heritable, that's something that Pinker argued in this. I wasn't particularly sure. But however, I do know that Dr. Helen Fisher, the, uh, the researcher that consults for dating services such as Match.com and OkCupid, so she develops the psychological profiles to try and connect these people. Same with um, eCupid. Is that the one? Like the one where you do this huge personality survey and that connects you with someone? So her uh, research focuses on love and compatibility and those things. And what she found was there is hormones that then influence personality. Uh, so more testosterone, you're going to be more disagreeable, more, ox uh, more oxytocin, you're going to be uh, more agreeable uh, to some extent. So she kind of outlined this, these roles that hormones play in personality. That shouldn't be surprising with modern gender. Uh, transgender uh, treatments, which is you interfere with people's hormones to then manifest more of the gender that they're wanting to create, um, or not so much create, but to become, uh, to achieve consistency. Whereas the, um, but then if, so then that would then, if you connect the dots, then it would be that genes lead to hormonal preference, leads to personality preference, leads to political preference. Um, so you kind of have that uh, area. But then uh, for the, uh, to tie that into smoke and then the abuse thing you raised, which is the statistics of suggestibility are really interesting. So 10% of people are highly prone to suggestibility. 90% of people are, sorry, 80% of people are somewhat prone, and then 10% of people are not prone to suggestibility. Um, so you can find this on the Wikipedia page for suggestibility or hypnobility or hypnosis. Um, so hypnosis has kind of been redefined in the academic world to just become suggestibility rather than the therapeutic thing we're used to where you get the wooden spoon going blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, so, but one of the things they found about the 10% that are highly suggestible are people who have suffered severe trauma or abuse. So that would then make sense, which is, you know, they suffer severe abuse. They need to have some type of, their, not only does the brain structure, but the worldview needs to be able to adapt to accompany that because it's a situation where your natural abilities of expressing yourself have been stripped away from you. So there is going to be a portion of your brain that is now maladapted to abusive behavior when you're really constrained, like let's say someone who is locked up in a room for extended years, right? Um, so the normal abilities of autonomy and whatnot would be damaged. Um, so oh, those would then uh, shut down to a extent. Um, in which case then they would be more prone to suggestibility because that is the adaptive strategy in those situations, which is you do what you're told, right? And so uh, 
previous strategies around that would die out very quickly in the same thing that you know you know that uh, or you know it's asserted that willpower is a muscle you build it you build attention you build focus you build resolve you build goal setting these are things you build over time whereas if you ate junk food over time then you know you're going to be damaging uh, your willpower to an extent so you know you build up habits over time and those habits become more concrete but that depends on your ability to build those habits in the first place and your proclivity to building those. So marketing is all about exploiting uh, one's kind of, uh, the book influence goes into this where they, where they call it the click were response, which is more automatic responses to suggestions. Um, so the realm of marketing is to say, you know, hey, uh, here's some suggestions that we're targeting to a specific demographic will, which will probably be exploitable by that suggestion. So then if we link that, then well, we could say that, or one could say um, it would then make sense for identical twins uh, when we consider genes, hormones, personality, politics would then be exploited by the same cigarette companies because the uh, same cigarette companies are marketing to personalities, they're marketing to certain value systems, um, which is like, because, you know, either way, you're still smoking the same thing, but uh, they're like, if you've, I don't know, if you've seen cigarette ads or alcohol ads, they're always targeting certain values. And we see this with um, junk food uh, ads as well. They target... Uh, try and exploit certain value systems as well, like the Kylie Jenner's Pepsi uh, thing, which is like, mm -hmm. oh, turns out liberals aren't drinking Pepsi. What if we try and rebrand Pepsi <laughs> to be something that, you know, is compatible with liberal values? Um, so that would be my theory, uh, well, my proposition there of how, how those things are connected. I, I appreciate uh, those insights as as you're speaking and, and sharing with me uh, regarding the twins and, and the rubber bands um some uh, just like a thought experiment that went into my head and something i'm going to research more to see if anybody's done it is you know if we were to and, and i guess this is what through the blank state we're, we're trying to discover is like uh kind of similarly is if we had two twins and we imagine that one of them was in society and uh and let's say that uh they they took oxycodone because they had to they had a they had pain and then they were on adderall and then they decided to snort it and now they're being marketed rubber bands um the way that their brain is going to behave kind of curious how that would be contrasted against somebody who who would be the twin but they're not in society maybe they're they're, they're they've actually been adopted into like uh, a native vegan community. There's vegan communities that have been not even taken honey from from honeybees for thousands of years. Um, and and if obviously if we came to that native, we wouldn't see the rubber band on their hand. But also, it, I'm curious, would we? And and this is I, I'm going to do some research on this. But what it's making me ask for from personal next steps is just that that native person would would uh, make decisions that were bad, which would negatively impact their community uh, without having those memes sold to them. Of, oh, you know, relax or focus or, or, or be on the wild side and smoke a cigarette, as opposed to the folks who are in society and who are being, uh, being uh, malleable by, by those different things. And then we might be uh, kind of curious to see if those people in society then than, than how their mistakes would be compared to their twins' mistakes and such. So just some thoughts right. there. Yeah, so let me tackle that. I just realized one of the things I should say is that, so what I raised about the abuse damaging parts of the brain, uh, that's so the study of neuroplasticity, which is how the brain changes according to our, I guess, our outputs, our individual outputs or our individual inputs. Um, but then the corollary to that is that just as the brain um, to, you know, can be damaged by abuse, then it can also heal from abuse. Um, you know, to what extent uh, the damage or the healing is, is, you know, to be determined, um, especially on an individual basis. But, 
you know, there is, if there is an abuse victim, you know, there is hope uh, there for, you know, you're not stuck in that cycle. There is, there is hope that people can, can get um, through, you know, and, and it's similar to, um, so for instance, uh, uh, which drug is it? Methamphetamine, crystal meth. So crystal meth works by releasing all of your dopamine receptors all at once, like all your dopamine outputs all at once. And your body reacts to that. So it's the best high you've ever experienced in your life, but your body reacts to that by exploding and shutting down the receptors. And that's why... Uh, because it's like, oh God, something has gone dramatically wrong. Um, we need to alleviate this. We can't control the output. That's what's wrong. So we have to control their reception. And it shuts those receptors down and destroys them. And then people who do crystal meth, they feel amazing for a day and then feel good for a week. And then they feel terrible for very long times pretty much forever unless they get uh, adequate treatment to kind of repair it. And there's some research certain drugs can facilitate in the repairing of those receptors, but just stay away from meth. <laughs> like that's the <laughs> that's the better option my, there. To confirm my understanding, are are you of the opinion that there is a certain tolerance of, of damage that could theoretically happen to a twin in which the neuroplasticity uh could repair the brain but if if one of them had had done math for whatever reason then then it's then it's a little bit different at that point yeah so for the twins i'll, I'll jump on uh good question so first before i jump onto that so in terms of like say abusive damage that's irreparable so there's the feral children so feral children are those which haven't had uh, the normal environmental upbringings that the average child would. So um, these would be children who have been locked in a crib for most of their upbringing. Or it would be children who were raised in the wild. So these children, because they've missed the important environmental cues to activate certain genes, and to also to um, facilitate and maintain uh, mental brain structures, uh, they have an incredibly hard time uh, integrating with modern society, uh, if at all uh, possible. Um, so they they you know they make attempts, but it seems um, their brain structures are just you know, they're adapted to wild environments or abused environments, and they find it very hard to adapt outwards. And this is also a case for prison uh, systems. One of the criticisms from um, people with prison, which is, you know, you could be creating um, structures, behavioral structures and mental structures that are applicable within controlled environments, but not applicable in uncontrolled environments of freedom. Uh, and this also, to tie it into the blank slate uh, things, this is one of the arguments, which is if we control the environment, if we believe in the blank slate, uh, so if we believe, you know, that in the ghost and the machine, in the blank slate as well, that nurture determinism rules over nature determinism, then if we control nurture, then we control nature. And so that's, and then the noble savages then say that nature is pure and that corruption or benevolence occurs through society rather than it being inbuilt into our nature. So therefore, we can have utopian or dystopian visions of the future, which are cultural rather than natural, which is to say that, you know, rape is a side effect of culture or gender is a side effect of culture or uh, the hierarchical system is a, a symptom of patriarchy. So if we just change culture, then we'll change the uh, expression of good and evil in the world. Now, this then ties on to the 
uh, well, what if an a identical twin was then raised in a tribe and one was raised in the West? Um, that was probably a misuse of the word tribe, but I'll say in terms of a yeah, third yeah. world tribe, right? Um, so the reason that they're exploitable by the same marketing is because the values, so hormones, values, personality, uh, politics, right? When you say so, they, are you referring to the society individual or the tribe individual? Or you're saying they're still both susceptible? Uh, so uh, in that instance, it would have been that, but it applies for any human, right? So hormones, values, um, personality, and then politics. So values also determine so along there is expression. So expression, you can think of genetic or natural expression, um, or you can think of that as also personal uh, and social expression. So for instance, natural expression of the male biology would be, um, you know, strength, whereas cultural or social expression of the male would then be suits, right? Um, so, ways to kind of assert um, that type of dominance in that hierarchy system. Whereas for a female, uh, there's going to be natural expressions, which could be tenderness, um, and then social expressions as well. Uh, you know, to what extent they are, you know, that's, that's feeble. Um, or, you know, they're interrelated to the point that they shouldn't be particularly be uh, separable, which is again the argument that Pinker proposes. So for the girl, uh, for the identical twins wearing the rubber bands, this is the reason they wear rubber bands is primarily because uh, there's a heritable component to personality, to values, to then politics, which is then expression. So for instance, uh, there's people who will get tattoos and there's people who won't get tattoos. Uh, this then comes as generally the idea of purity versus the idea of expression, so some uh, or whatnot. Or, for instance, in pickup artistry, uh, people wear ring that you could call it a pickup technique, which is people wear rings on different fingers to express different personality traits. So, in all of the movies, you'll generally see rings on uh, gangsters' thumbs. Uh, gangsters will wear. Um, rings on their thumbs or on certain things or maybe on the pinky finger um, so depending on where they wear rings in movies or in media then it will depend on personality traits of the individual um, because they're choosing to express different things or if they don't wear anything so the idea is if you don't wear any jewelry or anything then you're more of a free spirit who don't like to have external forces put on you whereas if obviously if you wear a ring a Finger, uh, sorry, wear a ring on your ring finger, uh, then you're <laughs> showing socially and expressing socially that you're in a relationship, uh, depending on which hand. Um, so there's different uh, things to that. So someone who, you know, in pickup artistry as well, one of the techniques is you wear tons of rubber bands on your wrist um, to then draw as the idea of peacocking, to draw attention to you. And then as well, if you pick up a woman successfully, yeah. then or a guy, whatever, then you would put the uh, one of the rubber bands on you onto the girl, onto the you know partner, uh, and then that way when you leave the situation, they have a reminder and they keep thinking of you uh, to kind of anchor into your presence into them. Uh, so those are then things about expression. So you know if one believed in the blank slate, then one would believe that uh, you wouldn't expect that you would think that two children reared apart or even reared two identical twins reared apart or even reared in different, completely different cultures, then they would um, be completely susceptible to the cultural expression. However, that's um, uh, not the case. And you would see this in terms of with parenthood. You have two children, you raise them the same, and for some reason they're different. <laughs> um, uh, when they're not identical twins. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and so then for this, uh, the, the, and so if you, you were to reject blank slatism, then it's to say that there is some type of 
nature-based thing that runs in individuals or even through families or even through societies that are based on your um, specificness or tolerance towards social versus group versus individual versus gene selection. Um, so even at an individual selection, it would there is these innate components to individual uh, temperaments, personalities, values that then express themselves differently to paste on, you know, even across different social situations. That's not to say that um, one's innate char characteristics are completely non-movable. Um, they're still changeable. So for instance, trauma uh, is one of the few things that will bring personality changes. Uh, that's that's very interesting, right? And well, not only does it bring personality changes, it would bring political changes, and it would also bring brain or hormonal changes as well, which would make sense, right? Because trauma is generally to say your previous worldview, your previous map of meaning, which is your previous political expression, was completely insufficient, and therefore, at what level of analysis do you want to do the repair? If you can do the repair socially. Then you can just fix it socially fine like you tell the friend quit doing that but if the friend continuously does that let's say they're a psychopath exploiting you over the long term then you have to change more and more um uh foundational aspects of yourself instead so for women uh they generally lean higher on agreeableness as well as neuroticism and this makes uh this is uh uh symptomatic in terms of negotiating pay uh so wage negotiations so they're more likely to not negotiate well to avoid conflict um to not be as assertive so generally the number one treatment uh for agreeable people uh because men and women could be agreeable it's based on the individuals to set women are on average more agreeable uh is generally assertiveness training so again this makes sense why women uh, generally to be abuse victims to the disagreeable because and again disagreeable people end up in jails and men on average are more disagreeable and men um, generally also have huge differences in intelligence whereas women it's more a uh, flat intelligence curve whereas for men there's huge avenues on the both ends of the spectrum there's super intelligent men and super dumb men whereas women uh, the intelligence curve is more uh, average, is more mellow. Um, so you get dumb men and disagreeable and they commit crimes and end up in jail. Uh, whereas smart men who are violent would probably go to the military um, instead uh, and protect people, uh, you know, find ways to express that nature uh, that way. So, okay, how do, what was my point? Um, to tie that in uh yeah so trauma will change uh you know we have to figure out when we're going about life which which thing to change uh and this is also why trauma doesn't really affect children as much as it does adults because for children there's less things to change whereas for an adult you know you could be changing 40 years of strategy or 50 years of strategy or whatever which is very difficult um to change Thank you for that. It uh, makes me really think a lot. Just this morning, I, I touched a, a rubber band with that had little, uh, you know, little plastic squares on it that my friend had made for me. It said, stay together. And typically you exchange it. And, and I actually thought the same thing when it was given to me, like, oh, this is kind of like a meme that's being propagated onto me. Um, you, you mentioned something. Uh, now, I'm afraid I didn't forget, but it, it, it sparked in me as you spoke about nutrition. Uh, I just watched uh, Peterson's video earlier today where he was talking about Bjorn Lomberg's book, uh, How to Spend $75 billion to, to Make the World a Better Place. And uh, my, my personal takeaway from, from what you've shared, I, I know that you guys are um, dissecting essentially the book and, and uh, its impact, but what, what my takeaway from, from this conversation um, since I've spoken up is that there, there is a potential for for memes just like the for the rubber band for us as individuals who who are um, who who have a vision for a better place there's a potential to impart 
something with, with someone else, like a rubber band, that can inspire each other to improve nutrition. Um, and, and that the, the, the implications of, of being able to, regardless if I can understand whether we are a blank state or whether we are, you know, the, the, the ghost in the machine, but just being able to know that there is there is some some level of of uh, you know of impact that we can have as individuals on on others, um, so that you know if I make a rubber band, maybe somebody would, will touch it in two years from now and, and be sparked in the same way because they're discussing something like this. That's that's really profound to me. Yeah. Uh, Nata, I know that you're short on uh, time. Do you do you want to yeah. dive in and and do yeah okay well I, i'm just saying, saying i know that you're about, yeah i know that you're short on time right like you're you're leaving in like 40 minutes yeah. or so yeah it was yeah leaving. yeah yeah so i just it, it's yeah. there things you want to because i mean i can keep going through the book but then i'm i'm afraid that we're not going to get you know any key points from you if i keep doing that so do you want to raise like mm -hmm. the key discussion points you want to talk about now and then um uh, and then we can tackle those now hmm. yeah i i don't know um <laughs> but i can say i read the book like several years ago uh so and now i just uh, skim through it like some pages um so i i'm not that prepared for this uh, conversation but uh i remember liking the book when i read it um but I, I think if I had read it today, maybe it would have been different because a, a lot of the things like I already know now, like since, yeah, it's discussed more, more maybe than when I uh, read the book. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's all I, all I have to say. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, but I, I I like the book, and I I think that maybe you didn't have the same yeah. Well, <laughs> it's um yeah. Well, I'm being a lot more uh, reflective and um humble uh, tonight than I was uh, this yeah right now in this meeting than I was on the group chat yesterday. Um, because yeah so i started reading the book on monday and i finished it uh yesterday but um yeah I, i'll but i don't know maybe it's also that you know you invest 10 hours into reading a book and you don't really you know if it's saying things you already know that's one area of frustration and then if they're also uh neglecting uh you know certain things that also seem obvious to doing that so uh, yeah, so let's touch on that now. So my review of the book so was more or less on two accounts. One is the book was written in 2003, published in 2003. And if I read it then, or even if I read it in 2013, uh, that would have been incredibly helpful. So, you know, my philosophical education came more in like 2015. And it came through observing many of the things Pinker actually talks about in the book, such as the academic issues or with certain tactics that are being deployed in the workforce or in academia. Uh, so, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos, he came to fame around that time. And, you know, there's the Berkeley protest where protesters, you know, dressed up with face masks and caused millions of dollars of damage. And you watch that as an Aussie and you're like, why would anyone get so offended over speech uh, kind of thing? And, um, you know, and then that kind of led me on to this journey of, you know, it's just like if, if the guy's ideas are bad, criticize them. Like, you know, use words that Australians use that Americans don't particularly like, right? And, and you know, as the, the Aussie movie show, you know, get in a brawl but then have a beer afterwards. Right, like, like it just kind of baffled me. But then, uh, you know, but then I had to get the learnings through other means. Whereas, if I, you know, through uh, 
Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and through Jordan Peterson, through Miley, through Karen Straw and through all these people who are presenting arguments that I never had heard before ever in my life. Um, whereas Pinker has done, you know, a, a commendable job uh, kind of trying to integrate the two sides. Um, and now I say that in terms of commendable and, and really in 2003, like, way to go because you know most of the world only really came to consciousness about these issues like the general public only came to these the consciousness of these issues in really 2015 2016 and with trump kind of thing trump fighting that culture war that was accurately predicted by people who thought it was a culture war um whereas for uh those who were completely unaware of the culture war aspect then you know, Trump was a complete surprise. Um, so in that area, I think, it, you know, the work was fantastic and, and very uh, prophetic in that area. The thing, the issues that caused me incredible frustration was that his reasoning uh, often at times, um, it, the book is 500 pages long. This is a very big book. And the concepts within the book are not maybe like if you were incredibly progressive and progressive leaning and with progressive orientations and values, then 500 pages is probably necessary to be able to convince you of an alternative viewpoint. However, if you don't inherently have those fears that drive those beliefs and those three things, then you're not going to particularly find anything that Pinker is saying um, that's important or, you know, you're just going to think it's very mundane. Um, and in that area, then Pinker played many platitudes or it, to some extent I felt he was even placating the reader by falsely uh, attesting to certain beliefs only in the later chapter to then dismiss them. So he would run along with the beliefs of this as if it's true, and then at the later chapter start to kind of dismantle it. Whereas, you know, to someone who's already familiar, then that seems like a contradiction because he's saying one thing at the beginning of the chapter and he's saying the complete opposite. Um, and John also picked up that he felt there was a lot of more left-leaning debate tactics, tools of ridicule or contempt or uh, virtue signaling or group association. So Pinker often at times he'll use the terms enlightened, repugnant, misuse, uh, and other moral terms to describe people's positions. Um, and that to me was just like, you're meant to be a, uh, like, it, it, and you also use I language a lot. And that was very perplexing to me. Like, you're meant to write a, uh, an authoritative book about something social, except you keep using I language here and there. Like, what, why do we you care at all? I language, like the, you know, I, these are my beliefs, or I am sympathetic to this, uh -huh. or blah, 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 I, uh, right? And I'll be like, I don't care at all about what your personal beliefs are or, or whatever. I just care about what the arguments are, right? So a lot of what the book is like, you know, he presented these concepts and presented the contentions, um, but the contentions often at times fell into uh, kind of tribal warfare or bickering between two different factions. Um, where it was just like, this faction is doing this, this faction is doing this. And, and a lot of the negative reviews of the book kind of said he was straw manning the two sides. Um, where, and I felt a lot of times he didn't give the devil, the devil its necessary Jews, which is, you know, he threw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, so that means like he, for those not familiar with those phrases, it means, you know, he would recount someone's position and again, using a complicated term, using straw man thing. So he would say, you know, this is what these people are saying. This is the extreme form of it. 
the extreme form is wrong because of this. <laughs> and uh, and then and then as if then that was to then rule out the non-extreme forms. Uh, and he would do that on both sides. And then the last bit where he's talked about politics, there was so much Americanisms where it was just like, the you know, and it required like a more American or maybe even European to an extent perspectives, where it was like the political left, the political right, this is what the left believes, this is what the right believes. And as we found like over the last 10 years is like, authoritarians exist on both except he put authoritarianism as a politically right trait um and this is where like the terms right and left are completely failing in the modern uh the modern dialogue uh of today which is that they don't seem adequate now to describe in the factions because now that the right is no longer religious uh, you know and a lot of the authoritarians who required social because he his left was more liberal leaning uh, and liberal in terms of more high on openness, um, whereas now we know that the left is not but like yeah Silicon Valley is filled with people high on openness, but they're people who are silent conservatives and they're people who are vocal politically correct authoritarians. Um, so there's difference there. And then Peterson also mapped, you know, what is political correctness on personality traits? He's published research on that. Um, so I felt like his descriptions of things, you know, maybe they were like, I felt the reasoning was quite muddled. So the issues he rose were, were commendable and, and whatnot, but his reasoning to explain them were a bit muddled. And and the same thing, my criticism of the rape book, they didn't go far enough in imagination of certain things that would probably have been way too contestable at that time to even engage with, like, say, social selection. Like, first, let's just try and get the general public on board with individual selection. <laughs> like, let's just try and get that little win. <laughs> and then after that, then, you know, we can engage with ideas of group selection because group selection, like the Nazis weren't going on about, hey, let's exterminate the Jews because of individual selection. They were doing that based on group selection, right? So then that caused a lot of evolution research to be thrown out. Um, and it made people very scared who were studying evolution to then use any of that terminology. But now, you know, with the alt-right, coming into power as well as the left equivalent of the, the alt-right, which is like black power and black autonomy, which is kind of interesting. There's like white autonomy and then there's black autonomy uh, as these two American forces. Is that they're both wanting the same thing. They're both wanting segregation <laughs> based on group alliances. <laughs> so, um, you know, but we need, you know, things that actually uh, talk about those things. And so, we, like, for instance, I felt at times Pinker often committed, uh, and I researched this because I was arguing it in the group <laughs> chat, and I was just like, I'm sure there's a thing called the fallacy fallacy because a lot of the times uh, there was a particular chapter uh, where he was arguing about, where he presented the arguments of, well, this is a natural fallacy or this is a moralistic fallacy. And a lot of the debate style that he would do would be, this is a fallacy, don't believe it because it's a fallacy, right? And then when you actually connect the dots of what he's saying, it's just like, wait, wait, what? You, it's sometimes you're the one committing the fallacy <laughs> because by ascribing things as, so the, the naturalistic fallacy, when it's used correctly, uh, is to say that just because, uh, so it's going to be hard to explain. So let me just try it. So the, uh, so the naturalistic fallacy would be just because something is natural does not make it moral. So a example of the fallacy being committed would be rape occurs naturally, therefore rape is moral. Um, now, then there would be the innatural uh, fallacy, which is what I posited, which is to say that anything, because if you completely reject, uh, so a fallacy only becomes a fallacy when its reasoning is untrue. So it's a general assumption that one applies, which had incorrect logic. Its logic was untrue. But if its logic was true, then it's not necessarily a fault unless the reasoning to get to that conclusion was a fault, uh, was fallacious, fallacious, if that's the right word. 
Um, so for instance, you know, one could then say, well, you know, the natural fallacy is to assume that something that is natural is moral. But then that can lean people into, you know, doing the same thing, like the complete inverse, which could be called the innatural fallacy, which is then to say, well, because we can't possibly assume that anything that is natural is also moral, then that would then make the default that anything that is unnatural is moral. Therefore, giving credence to the blank slate, which is to say that because nothing natural can be moral, therefore morality must arrive from purely innatural social mechanisms. Uh, instead, uh, and his moralistic one, uh, let's see if I can find the moralistic fallacy. Um, da, 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 uh, da, da, da. But it was pretty much like the same type of uh, situation in each of these arenas. Da, da, da. Isn't it just the opposite if something is moral then it has to be natural or? oh yeah that's it perfect thank you nata yeah. yeah so the moralistic fallacy is as nata said yeah if something is moral then it must occur within nature but so then you could say well um we are consider that one is is just so preposterous i don't understand how anyone takes any stance on that because if we apply this at the extreme to then say, okay, well, virtue is moral, therefore it should be natural, therefore we should see it, like, what does that actually mean in detail? Should we then see it in some societies? Should we then see it in all societies? Should it mean that we should be okay not seeing it in any society um, at all? And it's just uh, this kind of, uh, let me see if I can, uh, ah, okay, here we go. So this is the ex explicit thing um, that I raised. Um, so when... Okay, I, I don't... This kind of... Da, da, da. Okay. It, it, Nata, you, you riff for like five minutes while I find the exact argument here. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I have to go now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, sorry, but I, I will. Yeah, it was nice meeting you too. Uh, so I I will listen to you for a while. <laughs> you just Before left me out to dry. <laughs> what? You just left bit out to dry like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. You have a good night, Nata. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks, Nata. Bye. <laughs> So what was the conversation about? Sorry, my internet chopped out for a little bit. It just got back. Were you guys discussing the naturalistic fallacy? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then the moralistic uh, fallacy. Okay, so Pierce, uh, Pinker uh, said, the naturalistic fallacy leads quickly to its converse, the moralistic fallacy, that if a trait is moral, it must be found in nature. That is... Not only does is oh, so this is where Pinker <laughs> shits me. Let me share my screen. Um, because he says something, and then the sentence immediately connecting it here, <laughs> it doesn't connect at all with this statement. Like this is where he commits like the fallacy, fallacy. Like as soon as the following it's sentence, it's way too small. Okay, uh, let me, ah, oh, shit, yeah, I, I'm in the ginormous big monitor phase. All right. Um. Thank you. Okay, so on the right-hand side here uh, is what we're wanting. So the naturalistic fallacy leads quickly to its converse, the moralistic fallacy, that if a trait is moral, it must be found in nature. And he summarizes that as, that is, not only does is imply ought, but ought implies is, as if that belief is the moralistic fallacy. And then he follows on. Nature, including human nature, is stipulated to have only virtuous traits, so no needless killings, no rapacity, no exploitation, no traits at all, because the alternative is too horrible to accept. That is why the naturalistic and moralistic fallacies are often associated with a noble savage and blank slate. 
but then, uh, so my, okay, I'm not going to, this is probably going to be a bit too small, but it says, it depends on how you define moral. If you orient your morals not in your subjective intuitions, but against morality as objectivism does, you do not run into this issue, nor the moral fallacy. This is only a fallacy of, say, nonviolence is moral. Therefore, nonviolence must be the only thing in nature. It is the inverse of the natural fallacy that what is moral is what is in nature. However, both are obviously stupid. Your summary of ought implies is, and is implies ought, is the fallacy, uh, is the fallacy, is hogwash thinking, and or is muddled thinking. One defines, if one defines the moral as something outside of reality, then tries to employ it against reality, then disaster ensues. That's the fallacy. If one defines the moral as what occurs in nature, then applause morals against it, then they can optimize for a byproduct instead of an adaption without respect to proximity and cues. That is the fallacy, right? So the fallacy being exploited here, like when is the natural fallacy, is then to say, well, you know, rape occurs in nature, therefore rape is moral, therefore let's implore reality to go again for this moral that we've asserted. Or that we can say, well, nonviolence is moral, therefore let's implore reality to be nonviolent. Uh, and that's cases where, you know, we see it. But if you just say, so for instance, like the, uh, the multi-level selection or the evolutionary synthesis uh, theory, uh, or I, I still haven't read the book, that's the book in two weeks, uh, the evolutionary synthesis. Uh, that we'll be reading in two weeks, but the, 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 Who's that by? Uh, let me, I pulled it up. Uh, let me, um, just, uh, okay. Is yep. that going to be the next, the next, uh, hangout? Um, okay. So the next the hangout. Next yeah. So the next one next week is going to be, uh, uh, da, da, da. Adapting Minds, Evolutionary Psychology and Persistent Quest for Human Nature by David Bullock. The one in two weeks is going to be Evolution, the Extended Synthesis by Massimo Pigalucci and Gerd uh, Muller, Massimo Pigalucci, okay, Gerd Muller, oh, John okay. Beatty, Sergi Garbuslis, David Wilson, Greg Wary, uh, wow. Michael. Perugin, Eva Jablonka, Jablonka, there's 16 of them, and, and I yeah. can probably say all 16 names. Yeah, I so, recognized a couple of those, actually. One of them is yeah. an uh, evolutionary biologist and also like a stoic. And then, yeah, David Sloan Wilson, he was somebody I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So it'd be a really good book, because it's kind of like these people are saying, hey, all your theories of evolution can actually be integrated. And we can do it without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. <laughs> Except it's such a preposterous claim to so many people. So that's why they need 16 authors to co-author that yeah. book. <laughs> but yeah, it looks like it's probably like a collection of essays, one from each author. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. So, so for instance... Um, yeah, so like a lot of the time, like so the fallacy fallacy is then to say, well, that's a fallacy, therefore I can throw out its conclusion, um, which I feel Pinker does a lot. Whereas if he actually engaged with what he's calling a fallacy seriously, then he would realize that, oh, no, these aren't. So, for instance, one of the things that I suspect Pinker would throw out uh, incorrectly is, uh, and to some extent, the, the natural history of rape authors also did uh, this, which is they threw out, um, they throw out social selection because it could be considered a naturalistic fallacy. Uh, that's what it seemed. Because, so for instance, the feminists uh, in the natural history of rape, so the, the largest people who were exhibiting uh, contention for that book were the feminists and their argument was if you give credence to biological causes of rape then you justify rape therefore we can't eliminate it so that's the natural fallacy uh, uh, to some extent right and this is where like 
you know, any intellectual, it seems, who is just like, hey, that's a fallacy, they're playing a dodgy game uh, and a little bit because you can argue these things without flooring around the terms of uh, fallacy all the time. Um, so, you know, for the feminist credit, then, yeah, like that is true to an extent. You can't, if rape is... Um, a byproduct or related to evolution in an extent, a byproduct of evolutionary strategies or an adaptive measure, then yeah, it's going to be an inherent part of the human condition. Therefore, it can't be eliminated. And this is a fear that it seems I'm positing is in mostly agreeable and left-leaning people. So agreeableness generally leans towards being left-leaning, which generally leans to people who are more... Uh, contention you know believers of the blank slate but if we look into psychological issues of agreeable people then it's conflict avoidance they do not like conflict and they also enter into um positions of society which are conflict avoidant or in strategies deployed or in roles that deploy strategies to avoid conflict so and this would make sense right because agreeable traits this again None of the authors have said this. However, I don't think it would be contentious if you follow the reasoning. So I'll posit it, which is that um, that it would make sense that women... So, for instance, it is observed that women are higher in agreeableness and eroticism. It has been observed these things manifest in certain personality traits and certain values and certain behavioral traits, such as conflict avoidance and desire for nurture. Right now, not all women are that way, of course, and some men are more agreeable and exhibit more feminine traits. Fine, that's also why we have transgenderism, right? Because certain men uh, have, you know, exhibit uh, certain traits that are not generally masculine, and certain women do uh, exhibit masculine traits, right? So, but in general, those are the cases. So, this would also make sense from a family perspective, which is high disagreeableness, high desire. Or, or apathy towards conflict as well as lower neuroticism allows men to go out into the unknown to unstable environments to acquire resources to get natural to get sexual selection credence to then get selected by women who then are orientated towards nurturing and fostering harmony within the home for better child outcomes that's not to say this is a prescription for females and males this is you know, just prescriptions for those archetypes of gender roles that are higher in females and males. Um, now, it would then follow that, well, the women, the, the feminine role in the family is one of conflict avoidance, of treating each child as equal, of equity. So, for instance, in masculine cultures such as Sparta, in times of high conflict, high scarcity, then they crushed uh the scowls or threw babies off the cliff that were deformed in any way and that would make sense because your society must compete against other aggressive societies and there is scarce resources so resources must go towards strength because strength is what protects the weak and you can't have weak men um because otherwise the society would fall to stronger uh enemies so they make that decision, whereas the female bet is the nurturing capacity is then to say, I will, is a counterbalance, which will then say, we must treat all of our children as equal and do that sympathy. And we must treat all people as equal because, and that's a counterbalance, because if the society optimize, uh, you know, for hypermasculinity, then it could come into a state where that masculinity now has no enemy to eliminate. In which case, then traits such as you know, or atypical traits such as autism, um, or different things like introversion or or whatever intelligence uh, would go higher. Uh, so things that reduce loyalty, yeah, um, so high intelligence, low agreeableness would interfere with loyalty to an extent. Um, so, but then you can create a society that is more applicable to creating wealth from within rather than seizing wealth from without. Uh, so, you know, it would make sense with these tenements within women why are they conglomerated around nursing 
why they conglomerate around HR, why they conglomerate around accounting, uh, because these are the roles that they would have facilitated naturally in their own families. Uh, they're now just doing it at a societal level instead. And then also why men conglomerated around engineering if they had the intelligence or aggression, such as military, or just general grunt work, such as butchery, uh, lumberjacking, or the rest, so the low intelligence sides, um, because they're just manifesting the family roles, but out in the family of society instead, now that the individual family is now uh, superseded by the state family instead. So that makes uh, sense. Um, at least, it, you know, if you follow the reasoning, then it would. So, but then there's the I. So that's one side of the argument, right? And then the other side of the argument, uh, or one of the other things, is from the economics perspective. So Pinker, again, his area of expertise is studying language development in children, um, and so that's where his Ghost in the Machine chapter really showed his expertise because it showed that certain brain structures are necessary for developing language, um, and Without those brain structures, then language doesn't develop. And it also shows why humans have this capacity compared to other animals. Why specifically we have human languages versus non-human languages. And why other animals don't seem to particularly understand uh, grammar, human grammar. Uh, that's something they can understand words and symbols, but they don't seem to understand grammar. And so Pinker argues that grammar is actually something that we have an innate mechanism within our brains to understand which is very, very interesting um, in similar ways that, you know, you can see a baby deer be born and something is walking. It's just like, how the hell did it do that? Well, it's because there's innate abilities to allow that flexibility. Um, so from an econ so Pinker argues against uh, certain economic interests because he would say that, for instance, one of the quotes I took issue with was he said, we optimize against ultimate economics because uh for compassionate reasons um but however if you go completely against economics then your society would be uneconomical and collapse and require adaptation to become more economical um and this is one of the hard things so a straight up uh uh economist um, depending on, so a libertarian, sorry, maybe I shouldn't say libertarian, but at least from all the reading I've personally gotten, and maybe I'm unique in this, maybe it's a new theory that I haven't heard anywhere else, but it's been in so many books and hinted to in so many books that I'm just, it just seems people haven't connected the dots and labeled it. But my, my theory that I, that I'm proposing that I seem to have gotten hints from, from everywhere is, uh, moral economics which is to say that something that is economical becomes moral and something that is uneconomical ceases to be moral. And this makes sense uh, when you take into account social selection, which is to say that within a society, if certain traits become economical, so Daniel Defoe in his book, uh, A Treatise of Marriage, uh, proposed that, for instance, when, West, when colonizers uh, appeared on the length of the tribes in the tropics, they were surprised that the tribesmen didn't particularly wear clothes. They and they ruled that as not having modesty. Uh, and that was a aspect for colonization, uh, or you know, of say your culture is inferior. However, Daniel Defoe said, well, there would be no need for them to wear clothes because it's humid. Uh, therefore they don't develop that moral behavior. Uh, whereas in, um, in you know, countries that actually have an icy winter, then it, you have to wear clothes, otherwise you will die. So therefore, it then becomes moral to wear clothes. Um, and it would then make sense as well uh, in areas uh, where it is hot, where you would also wear certain clothing. So certain clothing styles would arise. So certain forms of dress, because those dress are more compatible to the environment. So reflect more heat, allow more airflow, whatever. Like you don't want to be wearing a suit in hot environments where you're going to sweat 
because you could end up with yeast infections or fungal infections and all the rest that will thrive and then kill you, right? So you want to, your behaviors or your outcomes need to be, or your moral adaptions need to be economical. Otherwise they will go out of blue and they will collapse. Um, and this just, I don't know, it just seems completely self-evident when taken seriously um, or, you know, taken when one puts away, I, I don't know, it just seems self-evident. But, um, you know, at least if I read all these things and it still seems evident, then, you know, that can be my research paper, I guess, and just call it moral economics. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, and because it avoids the two fallacies as well. Because it avoids natural fallacy, because obviously, if we just implore morality against nature, then we'll get wiped out. And in the same way that imploring uh, modesty of conservative dress in hot climates will cause um, uh, infections that can kill you. And then wipe that, wipe that out. Like you're not going, like a, a morality isn't going to last. Uh, if it's uneconomical. And then you have the moralistic, it solves both those fallacies, like it solves the moralistic fallacy as well, because then it says, well, and that's where Peter, uh, where Pinker was saying, well, the ought influences the is, and the is influences the ought, is a showcase of the fallacy. And it's just like, no, no, Pinker, no, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, was that coherent? Did that make sense? So I need to elaborate on that. I, I just had a quick question, like, when you're speaking about it being moral to, to wear clothes, where you're, um, not certain if that's like times or like Wim Hof might you know swim naked in the Arctic for for 20 minutes, but but it, and and if it was a blanket statement, then some of the thoughts going through my head is, is uh, how how that could be attached to moral or immoral, like if it's based on a framework of like Ayn Rand, where you know life. If, like your the man's life is is you know what you you have to push for uh because i also know like from from some other perspectives like maybe some individual who sets themselves on fire for activism then then maybe being maybe being naked for for activism could also be uh moral so kind of kind of curious to to see how you arrive to uh, a conclusion like that yeah, so a good example then will be seppuku in Japanese culture, so the suicide where they take the sword and then uh, cut out their entrails. So, um, so yeah, yeah, seppuku. Uh, I may be pronouncing it incorrectly. I haven't heard I, any Japanese. I think words. I am too. I'm awesome. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so with uh, seppuku, then it, um, you know, that doesn't make that much sense Uh you know, in isolation, but then when you apply it into their culture. So, for instance, Daniel Defoe, uh, he argues that um, there's modesty, there's honor, there's virtue, and all these things. And um, then there's also like temptation. So, what he presents in this book. And so, Daniel Defoe is the author of Robinson Crusoe, but he also was a famous philosopher of the time, and one of the books he wrote in the 1700s, I believe, was uh, A Treatise of Marriage. So, you know, I'm here, and I'm like, you know, I hear all these arguments of polyamory, and I'm like, oh, you know what I should do? I should read some books that are against polyamory uh, kind of thing. So then I was just like, okay, let's go on archive.org and then search books about sexual ethics, and that was one of the books that came up, and I got like 10 pages in, and I'm like, holy shit, this is so much unbelievable wisdom in it that just hasn't propagated and it's just Sorry, what was it amazing called? uh treatise of the of matrimony or treatise of marriage so if you search daniel defoe treatise of marriage on archive.org then it'll show up um the entire title so books back in the 1700s the title was huge um so okay a treatise concerning the use and abuse of the marriage bed by daniel defoe yep. Thank yeah, you. so in a TI use, so for instance, um, that morality is what arose from what is economical, and then we deploy social strategies to, and then culture kind of adopts around that. So for instance, we would then have modesty uh, as the protection of what is economical. 
So someone who is modest would be someone who is or aligned with what the economical interests that have been established for the group. And then we deploy shame and these other tools as these more intuitive concepts, but they're still designed to to protect the the economical sure, uh, assurances of those behaviors. So, for instance, you know, in a case of high SDIs, and and also in the case of economic outcomes of polyamory in a developed nation that requires wealth propagation through families. Um, and also, so one of the uh, social strategies for monogamy is it prevents gender and gender competition, also intragender competition. So if every man gets a woman, every woman gets a man, uh, you know, the same, <laughs> same ones, <laughs> then uh, uh, through monogamy, then it eliminates male on male competition and it also eliminates female on female competition. Whereas if you destroy monogamy, then men are competing with men and females are competing with females. And that is very bad for society's productivity to an extent. Um, however, with modern with modern American culture, with the advent of Tinder, and said it seems maybe this is a strategy that is unconscious to deal with the overpopulation and the changing role. So the the uh, the difference of supply and demand for jobs that are adequate. So for instance, Tinder it allows females to relate with the top men. So 20, the top 20% of the men share 80% of the females. This is something that has been observed of Tinder. Um, so 80% of the men are now considered sexually useless. However, in a society that moves towards rewarding intelligence, and intelligence you know, being a bell curve, then anyone below probably isn't going to amass resources. So then it would make sense to have those which you know acquired the most success to then populate as many women as possible to then breed more fitness into the society so um, that seems to be their strategy there whereas if you are purely if your economy revolves around jobs that anyone could fulfill uh, so you know there's going to be you know manual jobs industry jobs you know trucking jobs intelligent jobs you know a good distribution of white collar and blue collar jobs then every man has the ability to accumulate resources and every man has the ability to to attract a mate. Whereas if you eliminate, if you change the economy dramatically, then um, then only a certain portion of men will have the ability to attract a mate. And then that's going to be incentivized and rewarded. But you have the issue then where a large portion of the men are now disenfranchised and they need to find out something to do and that historically hasn't gone too well so we will see how it goes uh this time around um because and that's also like the calling to like take these books seriously because if men don't have a reason to an ultimate cause for their existence, then they will revolt or they'll kill themselves. And that's neither of those options are particularly good. But I guess if you're a, you know, a evangelical feminist, then probably the men killing themselves option is probably a good option considering the kill all men hashtag that became very popular. A while ago um so well, yeah yeah i just wanted to say um based based upon what you're originally sharing uh from the book and, and the fallacy uh didn't really have any additions there and then when it got to other than that's not moral uh to to, to me i mean when i when everything's so interconnected and i start connecting it back to like some of the ideas uh, you were discussing earlier about uh, suicide and how you know sometimes uh in the spartan cultures for example well well it was, it was moral to them then and then i almost start to to think well in a framework of i'm going outside in the cold because i'm elderly and i can't you know economically su support uh resources anymore and i'm just taking them up I, I i don't know that even i would 
you know where to where to start uh, with the roots of uh, of questions and how to determine the answer there. But uh, I I do appreciate what you've shared about the uh, the Tinder experiment. I've got that research pulled up and uh, queued up for me to, to to dive into it because uh, definitely have been observing that uh, sort of uh, it, it's almost immoral to to use Tinder because it's potentially going to lead to depression if you are in the 80 percent of the of the men who aren't being sought out by those by those women so uh, that that's how it almost looks like to me so i do i am starting to see for the first time this connection between what's economical and and what's moral and uh that's that's very interesting point that you've made yeah well it's quite hard because pinker leans left and you can tell this from his answer to nihilism uh so let's let's jump into the fears um aspect of the book which is the justifications for holding on to these beliefs of blank slate uh noble savage and the ghost in the machine but before we do that i'm just going to take a one minute break and just get some refreshments um and i'll be back john okay. and, and octavian you guys can riff or whatever but i'm, I'm just going to take a one minute break okay sounds good hey john what what would you uh if you're gonna do refreshments i'll do some too but if not i'd love to refresh with you uh no i, I was just kind of been listening that that's the thing since i hadn't read the book fully uh you've been in as much much better with the, the notes and going through everything just getting a good understanding from what he's talking about gotcha yeah, yeah. i i can agree like even reading the summaries is nothing like listening to, to his in-depth uh different things that he's connecting here but yeah what, what were you going to share yeah yeah uh, i i don't know i i hadn't heard of the moralistic fallacy before i guess that might be more of an mm -hmm. informal fallacy that uh i don't know that pinker brought up fallacy yeah i actually want to look into this I'm not sure I even understand it properly. It's the informal fallacy of assuming that an aspect of nature which has socially unpleasant consequences cannot exist. Okay. So if X were true, then it would happen. Okay, so like the assumption that uh, because rape is wrong, it cannot be a natural phenomenon it might be a use of the moralistic fallacy. Or, or to make the moralistic fallacy uh right. if that was like how you were attempting to frame it if you're like trying to do science but still also retain your moral kind of framework at the same time that might be uh either causing you to do bad science or causing you to have to uh i guess leave off your moral framework for a while yeah. well the issue with fallacies is a fallacy is a is disconnected logic to say that one part of logic does not uh connect uh com compatibly with the previous piece of logic so mm -hmm. it, so if one so there seems to be, I guess, yeah, two fallacies that exert themselves in four different ways. So we can say that at what is moral is natural, therefore everything that is natural is moral. So everything that we see is moral, or that, and then we can have the inverse of that, which is um, nothing that we see is moral, right? I don't think probably, or nothing that is natural is moral. Then we can also have the moralistic one, which is to say that um, whatever we consider moral should be in nature, and whatever we consider uh, immoral shouldn't be in nature, right? Um, so all of those, then the what makes them fallacies is actually the disconnected logic, which is the assertion doesn't go with the conclusion, or the, the so doesn't connect logically that just because something is moral, it shouldn't be in nature or it should be in nature. Uh, you know, it could be in nature regardless. However, uh, where people become very eager to use these assertions of fallacies, where it actually inhibits correct science or correct evaluation is then 
you know, for the moralistic fallacy, it doesn't mean like, yeah. It, so for instance, one could then argue, uh, for instance, that, you know, sure, there will be immoral things that, so from the economic, uh, economical, uh, moral economics, then it, one could come off of that with an example of the, uh, of those fallacies, which is a fallacy that would come from that would then be to say, well, you're then saying that um, everything we see would then be economical, therefore it would be moral, whereas that's not the case at all. What I'm just saying is that, you know, we have something that is, it, you know, what is economical then becomes moral. Um, and when it ceases to be moral, uh, sorry, when it ceases to become when it ceases to be economical, then it ceases to be moral. And again, this is like a complete compatibility. Uh, like there's no logical inconsistencies there because there's, you know, for both of those things to be true, then there has to be, you know, times when, you know, there is competition and there has to be domains where they are, where they are applicable. So it also allows uh, different environments that reward different social strategies to then deem different things as moral, and that's fine. Um, and one of the arguments that I posited was that, you know, this also is then compatible why we don't yet see a universal moral, because there isn't yet a universal environment. If we had a universal environment uh, with all the same environmental cues, then we would have the same morality arise. But because we don't have the same environment because different environments reward different behavior, then we do see different moralities arise. Um, and then, you know, part of globalism or colonialism or, or I don't know, multiculturalism is to figure out how do we integrate the largest superset of behaviors and where those behaviors are applicable. So, for instance, you know, in the West, we rule out rape as, well, sorry, statutory rape as some, or even incest, as these are things that prohibit or inhibit the development of an adolescent into an integrated independent adult because the West values independence. It values agency. That is a, the framework of its law. Whereas in other environments where those things, where those things are less punished, then they value more social uh, controls of agency. So, for instance, arranged marriage it it provides better outcomes for the for the girl where a match partner is actually seems to be better than if there wasn't arranged marriage in those environments. But in those uh, environments, then it's achieved by the the parents exerting control over the child's uh, sexual selection strategies. Um, so there's a reduction of agency and then the children are into an arranged marriage where there isn't any particular conception of individual agency. It's all these group, as group associations. So husband and wife, child and mother, child and parents uh, instead. Uh, I can't hear you, John. For some reason, it's oh. going to you. But I can... Okay, now I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I was messing around. I forgot I was muted. Um, yeah, okay. You wanted to get back into... Uh, uh, there was something you were wanting to go into before you left. Yeah, the fears. So we'll dive into okay. the fears yeah. um, now. So, for instance... Hold up. Something's gone dramatically wrong with my computer. I'm going to hop off in like 15 minutes at 3 p.m. here my time. Yeah. Uh, all right, something, okay, I don't know. I, I'm powering a lot of hardware right now. Uh, but, okay, so Peter uh, Pinker's uh, fear, so the reason why one would want to believe in the blank slate or the noble savage or the ghost of the machine is he posits due to these fears, inequality, imperfectibility, determinism, and nihilism. So, okay, so inequality, uh, that's pretty much where the natural fallacy uh, can be exploited because it says then say, well, if men and women are different, then we can't achieve equality between them and that is bad. 
So this is a moral uh, uh, intervention against what is then perceived to be real or natural, right? Whereas it doesn't necessarily follow that, you know, that just because there is uh, differences in ability um, that that should be something to strive. So this is where the natural history of rape authors as well as Pinker seem to take a thing, which is they can they still distance themselves uh, from this idea that uh, they, they still so Pinker's answer to nihilism was look inside to your intuitions. Uh, so specifically the last chapter he wrote uh, so da 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 uh, whoops let me pull this up. Um, it's it's the only mind we've got, and we have no choice but to take its intuition seriously. If we are so constituted that we cannot help but think in moral terms, at least some of the time and towards some people, then morality is as real for us as it were decreed by the Almighty or written into the cosmos. And so it is with other human values like love, truth, and beauty. Um, so, ah, uh, okay, there was, I probably, maybe it's worthwhile just reading out what I wrote in the chat, but his, his appeal, his answer against nihilism was, we have these intuitions and we should look to these intuitions, um, and they would tell us how, you know, we should act, but then again, this is an exploitation of the same fear that his opponents are raising. Which is well, what happens when your intuitions are immoral, and this is where it's just like, no, this isn't the way to answer nihilism. The way you answer nihilism is to say that regardless of whether or not things have an inherent meaning, we are still called to act because we still have to choose how we will spend our lives. We have to make a decision of, with our limited time, why we would choose this thing over this, that thing. Therefore, we need an ability to then say, this thing is better, because you know we could say everything is arbitrary and we just go completely into hedonism. But however, we know, so then there is some alignment to intuitions, right? Which is that, you know, we will do some things and we'll be like, oh, this feels a little bit icky. Maybe I don't want to do that. We'll do some things and it feels a little bit better, right? And it'll be more aligned to our aptitudes or our our abilities or, you know, our, you know, I guess our intuitions or our instincts, you could say. But that doesn't, it doesn't stop there, though, because we still need the ability to discriminate. So, okay, let me, let me, where's my, one moment. My computer is having an absolute spin. Yeah, I guess to add to that, also with the 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 case for nihilism as I've seen it, kind of doesn't work at least the way I've seen it as put forward by J. L. Mackey in regards to moral nihilism, more, uh, where in order to even make the case that our moral intuitions are false, that things do have some sort of value to them, you have to utilize our own, like, differing moral intuitions about what things are of value and what things aren't of value. So, like, even in order just to do rational thinking, you have to carry the presuppositional uh, assumption that waking thoughts or, or waking experience is of a higher truth degree than a sleeping experience or, or dreaming experience that you have. Because like, these are both phenomenological experiences that we have of like what we, uh, how we, like different data that we're taking in. But one is with, one when I'm dreaming is, very different from the type of world we interact with when we're awake. And so just in order to make the case that 
our, our waking experience is more real than our dreaming experience. There has to be an evaluative uh, assumption there that there's some sort of value distinction between the two, which I don't know. I didn't go into that properly, but right. anyway. All right, so let me read out uh, some of the things I shared in our group chat. So, so one of the instances of Pinker's uh, bias is he, like, so for instance, uh, he will say, uh, it's kind of more. Octavian, uh, I don't know if it's you or something. There, yep. I hear an echo. I'm not sure if it's oh. been or um, are you. So what it is. You know. I am I am off of my uh, standalone microphone, so I'll just go ahead uh, and, uh, and mute until I have to hop off in like eight minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. I hope it I hope it helps. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So, for instance, um, let me just read out some of these things will make sense with the context, and some of these things won't, but they'll kind of tie it together. Um, so, Pinker says. This kind of moral reasoning can come only from people who know nothing about biology. Most activities that moral people extol, being faithful to one's spouse, turning the other cheek, treating every child as precious, loving thy neighbor as thyself, are biological errors and are utterly unnatural in the rest of the living world. My response to this is, just because they are unnatural in other areas doesn't mean that they are natural for us, nor does it mean that they are biological errors. They can be biologically enforced within our species, as they are with as they are with species that share the same sexual strategies. Because they are evolutionary, sound strategies for us, even if they are not for other species. So for instance, uh, he says, well, being faithful to one's spouse, turning the other cheek, treating every child as precious, loving thy neighbor as themselves, are just biological errors. So this is someone who rejects social selection. And it's just like, well, no, if you want factors in social selection, then it's those things have arise because there is uh, evolutionary advantages to them arising because environments pressure those things to become competitive strategies against uh, other, you know, because, yeah, I mean, that's true in of itself, which is you get an environment, you give it certain pressures, and then certain strategies will need to arise because of those pressures. Now, these could be individual, or they could be at the group level. So the book we're going to read in two weeks will go more into that. Now, but it's like to just call them biological errors. It's just such a uh, such short, short sightedness. So I continue. I just don't understand how he can condone sloppy thinking in his opponents, yet commit the same sloppy thinking in himself. Maybe this is the difference between philosophers and scientists. So scientists without philosophy operate on reality guided by intuitions. A philosopher without science challenges their intuitions without respect for reality. A philosopher with science challenges their intuitions based on reality. Pinker seems the scientist type here, who is criticizing philosophers that don't have science, while not realizing the role of his own intuitions in guiding his own beliefs. For instance, Pinker writes, of course we should try to reduce harmful behavior, just as we try to reduce afflictions like hunger, disease, and the elements. So my response to that is, and again, like this should be obvious that people see differently on that, um, and this is very left-leaning uh, belief system. So my response is, the question is how, what, why, what domain, what costs and benefits? Will it really reduce or will the intention make it worse? How do you define harm here? And et cetera, et cetera. As well as the inverse, are reducing hunger, disease, and the elements really pure? Why do you instinctively rule out ethics that incorporate them? What would the consequences of a world free of these be? Would it be better? By what metrics? And why are those metrics superior? I think this book is, I think, okay, that's something shared uh, uh, as a side effect. Pinker continues um, with this point. I do not claim to have solved the problem of free will, only to have shown we don't need it to solve it to preserve personal responsibility in the face of an increasing understanding of the causes of behavior. Nor do I argue that deterrence is the only way to encourage virtue. 
just that we should recognize it as an active ingredient that makes responsibility worth keeping. Most of all, I hope I have dispelled two fallacies that have allowed the sciences of human nature to sow unnecessary fear. The first fallacy is that biological explanations corrode responsibility in a way that environmental explanations do not. The second fallacy is that causal explanations, both biological and environmental, corrode responsibility in a way that a belief in an uncaused will or soul does not. So this like pinker. Uh, yeah, so that's Pinker's point. The next point Pinker raises is, how can we tell which theory is preferable? A thought experiment can pit them against each other. What would be the right thing to do if God had commanded people to be selfish and cruel rather than generous and kind? Those who wrote their values in religion would have to say that we ought to be selfish and cruel. Those who appeal to a moral sense would say that we ought to reject God's command. This shows, I hope, that it is our moral sense that deserves priority. Um, so, I don't know, maybe with a calmer mind, maybe saying we should appeal to people's moral senses rather than appealing to this external religious thing. However, the problem is, is that he views these things as incompatible, but they're not. So I've written, swap out God here for environment. Notice that different gods and environments produce different moralities in its people. There is not a universal morality through all of us that is waiting to be unlocked for application in all environments. No, there is ethics that are applicable to specific environments. How can you be this foolish thinker? It is not the moral sense that defines these similarities, as in how would it account for the differences? but the environments that define the moral senses differences as well as the similarities. So similar environments create similar moralities. Different environments create different moralities. So the extent of the similarities are to the extent where uh, the, the extent of the differences and the similarities at the extent that the environment is similar or different. So that is why gods battle and gods change with differing environments and why there isn't a universal God as there is not yet a universal environment. Appealing to universal morality, as you do, Pinker, is the equivalent of calling on a religion or a God with the same ignorance and bloodshed. Pinker continues, It's only the mind we've got and we have no choice but to take its intuition seriously. If we are so constituted that we cannot help but think in moral terms, at least some of the time and towards some people, the morality is as real for us as it was decreed by the Almighty or written in the cosmos. And so it is with other human values like love, truth, and beauty. Could we ever know whether they are really out there or whether we just think they are out there because the human brains makes it impossible not to think they are out there? And how bad would it be if we were if they were inherent to the human way of thinking. Perhaps we should reflect on our condition as Kant did in his critique of practical reason. Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The often, okay, this is an old word, I guess. The oftener and more steadily we reflect on them, the starry heavens above the moral law and the moral law within. So, it just like, like, so his answer to nihilism is look within your moral sense. It is true and it is shared. And it's just, it just is crazy to me. So I've written my response to that is, no, the answer to nihilism is if nothing had meaning, then do anything. But that forces you to act and decide what to do. So you need a value system, but you should not pick what is intuitive. You should identify the breadth of successful things and then hone in on the depth where your aptitudes align. So, yeah. But, well, yeah. there's a couple of things there I want to uh, go into. Uh, with the nihilism, um, uh, there's an element where you can't ever be a full on nihilist just because like, as Peterson's brought up before, like we experience pain and pain itself is something that cannot really be argued as like, Oh, I'm just going to go ahead and bite my own fingers off. That's 
it's something that if nihilism were true, this would be something that, or or if nihilism were true and we were able to act upon it as if it were true, then we would be able to act that we would be able to just bite our own fingers off with no nothing like stopping us. But even like even though we had the experience like oh this is a bad thing to be doing, that uh, we would still be it would still be actionable to say, uh, but yeah we're we're embodied within. Uh, we're embodied to a point where there are actual limitations that have to kind of be assumed that you can't do certain things. Uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but the other point I wanted to bring in was like if if our if morality is nothing more than our moral intuitions and our uh, senses, then that means that all our moral intuitions are automatically kind of correct because like there could be nothing besides our intuitions that we were uh, relying upon in order to make our decisions. So like if, if that mean if that's true, then it would mean that say the, well, just going into the kind of like campus, uh, the, uh, college campus situations where people's inability to uh, uh, like uh, people's moral allergies as I've kind of brought up before towards the potential let's say just to bring in a taboo s subject uh, of IQ differences between races just talking about like s statistically this is a m this is a subject that many people are morally allergic to being able to uh have take place um yeah. not that i'm interested in it. but anyway it, just to point out how this it, it, if it is our moral intuitions that we're always relying uh, that we're we must always hold be beholden to then a person's uh inability to uh, ex inability to accept a truth is going to inhibit us from acting upon that truth or even declaring that truth. So it, it, it kind of puts science and all of reasoning and like public discourse uh, to like in the back seat to how we feel about these types of topics. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, so again, for the structure, right? So, okay, there's the. Uh, so, this quote from early in the book, Pinker says Every child is born a savage that is uncivilized. So, if savages are naturally Gentile, child rearing is a matter of providing children with opportunities to develop their potential. And the evil people are products of a society that has corrupted them. If savages are naturally nasty, then child rearing is an arena of discipline and conflict, and evil people are showing a dark side that was insufficiently tamed. So, the the imperative here is that if you, so my note here is, so any failure you see in yourself, your child, your peers, would be the corruption of society rather than their own doing, and some moral duty for tyrannical purity. And the aversion for self responsibility. And just a little bit later uh, on page 11, uh, Pinker writes uh, So there is a quote Men are wicked, he wrote. A sad and constant experience makes proof unnecessary. And Pinker, Pinker oh, let me just share the thing. This is going to be too hard to. I'm not an audiobook reader, so I don't know how I'm meant to do it. So, but this wickedness comes from society. There are, uh, quote, there is no original perversity in the human heart. There is not a single vice to be found in it of which it cannot be said how and whence it entered, end quote. If the metaphors in everyday speech are a clue, then all of us, like Rousseau, associate blankness with virtue rather than with nothingness. Think for the moral connotations of the adjectives, clean, fair, immaculate, lily white, pure, spotless, unmarred, and unsullied, and all of the nouns, blemish, blot, mark, 
stain and taint. So the comment that I've had here is, hence the need to blame patriarchy as society's force. It is the source of all corruption of the innocent heart. Proponents just become a tool of those who know nature. Okay, I'm not going to read out the whole thing. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, so, the, because it's easy, right? So if you believe in the blank slate, which is that, you know, people are these blank pieces of paper, and then we can mold them, so nurture determinism. Then we can create out of them what we want. Uh, this has economic implications too, especially we see in the tech world, which is to say we have a undersupply of programmers. However, we have an infinitely scalable industry, potentially. So, you know, there's a lack of qualified engineers, there's a lack of even underqualified engineers, we need to create more to fulfill the economical demands. Again, this is where morality aligns with economy. So the desire here is to then, so blank slate is very appealing because blank slate says, hey, that child you want, even if they're interested in fashion or home rearing or whatever it is, or, you know, with woodwork, tough you know what would be better for them? Programming. You know why? Because programming pays more. It doesn't matter what their interests are. Those interests can be molded. They may, you know, their dream could be to be a fashion designer or the best woodworker. Tough programming. That's where it's at. And if they don't like programming, then that's the fault of society and raising them incorrectly to not like programming. Those patriarchal bigots trying to keep programming all masculine, right? And it's, um, so there's like a need, right, to grow more programmers. And the only way to do that is, you know, and the fear there is to do it by eugenics, right, which is then just to create biologically more people who are prone to, uh, to system design, mm -hmm. right, and engineering. And but then it's just I can't do that. That's what the Nazis ran by, right? But then the opposite of that is you do what the drove the communists, like the Soviet Russia, where it's like, it's like hey, we can mold anyone into the image of God, uh, even if their particular spirits may not be aligned with the spirits we want to endow. Um, and you know this is a problem, like you know, and it's horrifying when. You know, parents dismiss their child's interest to then push their own agenda on children. And, you know, they say, well, the child's interests are, you know, they got it from somewhere else. And I'm the ultimate authority here. And it's just this type of authoritarianism over other people. And But you drive this in. So then we have the noble savage, right, which is that anything that is blank is pure. right? And that's such an easy way to avoid responsibility. Because it's to say that anything that is bad for me wasn't my fault because I am pure underneath. It is yeah. the fault of someone else or of the, you know, it's just like a transformation of the devil to culture. Instead of the devil being a supernatural spirit, it's that the devil is society's claws or culture's claws in you. And therefore you have to amend culture, like you have to exercise the demons from culture rather than looking, hey, how do I actually exercise the demons from myself? And then we have the ghost in the machine, which is then to say that your conscience uh, is what rules over your body, that everything's just a matter of willpower. And you see this with like the woo, the spiritual woo teachers, like Deepak Chopra and yeah. whatnot, where it's just like, like you know, if all the, the poorly poorly uh, reincantated a version of the secret where it's just like, you know, the law of attraction, where it's just like there is an aspect of the law of attraction that's true, which is that if you adjust your focus, then you'll be able to catch more unknown things. But then you see abuses like the lady who wrote the spirit, who then who wrote the secret, who then said that the tsunamis that affected Thailand was due to unconscious desires <laughs> <laughs> and that they attracted the well, tsunami to them. That's the thing. With that, 
that um i don't know i i guess i lean more towards the, the secret side just because I, I realize how having that type of mindset can be much more much more useful in coping with the um that type of environment so let's say an, a hurricane doesn't happen to you and you're you hold the belief that the reason the hurricane happens to you is because of some sort of unconscious desires within you that need to be uh like these are demons within you that need to be um uh not exonerated but uh exercised that lends you to can deeply consider what is it that's wrong with me right now even if it has no actual causal relationship to the hurricane itself wait wait this but, isn't a good thing like it's well, it's it, only good if it were if it created uh outcomes that were beneficial because for instance uh there's the issue of uh people with like an atlas personality or superhero personality so people high on conscientiousness um which is high on self responsibility something traumatic could happen in their life that was not their fault at all so for instance um you know let's say the husband was uh let's say it's a woman high on conscientiousness her husband worked in uh the twin towers when they were bombed right mm -hmm. What belief does she come out of this with, right? Because if she's high on conscientiousness and think that she attracted that, then she's going to adapt beliefs that are going to be maladaptive to reality. Now, if the uh, so there is ways like you know so Buddhism and its role of not respecting the material in the East is a good example of an adaptive. Uh, uh, spirituality for natural disasters, which is if you if natural disasters destroy your material possessions, then uh, uh, then have a spirituality that is not upset by the loss of spiritual possessions, and then can facilitate that. Um, but if, or for instance, so you know you could have a situation like say you know Sam Harris would raise that hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago or whatever, right? Let's say the crop failed, right? What human sacrifice do you do? You look for the most unpure person and sacrifice them. Now, maybe that's a good strategy for, you know, now that the crop failed, you're going to have extra scarcity. So purge the most unpure and that somehow that provides an adaptive strategy, right? But the issue is that is, you know, those are, like uh, coincidental adaptations rather than directly uh, efficient adaptations. So you can avoid having something that is effective. So this is like this fear of um, uh, escalators, for instance, or elevators. It's just where, you know, someone's feeling of loss of control then um, of a situation manifests itself in the desire for absolute control. So an elevator, you're putting your entire trust into the elevator. And that is not something that someone who doesn't have a framework of, uh, you know, if everything must be my control, which is a complete belief in the ghost in the machine, uh, then uh, I should then it can become problematic when one does not have complete control and they have to engage in trust. Yeah. Instead. There. <laughs> See, there's an element of that that uh, I, I can understand. But besides that, like even with the 9-11 example, I, 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 yeah, I guess in, in that example, I would say rather than placing, externalizing blame onto, let's say, the Taliban or something like that, if instead, as a nation, you incorporated the understanding that, okay, we have grievances with our the Taliban brothers that brothers that are also on this planet with us, and they are, uh, they are not happy with how we've interacted with them, so up to now. So rather than placing the blame on onto them for acting upon what they saw as within the their their most economic choices that they could make. It's placing. It's still placing the blame 
internally on the the nation itself. Uh, that's the thing. Uh, I'm, yeah, but the issue there is you're working backwards, right? You're working in hindsight, whereas well, here, let me the read... strategy needs to be applicable for foresight. It needs to predict a good outcome, which is it needs to discriminate. So like to entertain that thought, right? Then what what type of criteria would the woman use to then say, we should grieve as a nation versus I should never allow my husband to work in a skyscraper ever again? Right, like how do they discriminate which yeah. uh, which strategy is the correct strategy to adopt? Well, both of those would still say the first one again because you were kind of cutting out actually. So whether or not we should grieve as a nation, or you know, oh, yeah. so you know, there could be grieve as a nation as a look internal one. There could be a eliminate the Taliban as one, or there could be. I will never allow my husband ever to hop in a skyscraper again, right? Or my future husband, because that husband's uh, dead, right? Or I will never allow any of my friends or family, my loved ones, to hop in a skyscraper, right? Which is, you know, if it's due to self-responsibility, you still need to have a way of discriminating which actions are going to produce the desirable effect and which ones aren't. Yeah. There's still the, the need, though, in... Like the mindset that we have is what enables us to cope with the situation that we're within. So, well, as you brought up with Buddhism being in an environment where the natural, uh, natural disasters are semi-regular, then having a, uh, I guess, not, a bit of nihilism pitted towards material, the material world, is kind of necessary. Um, then where was I going? Oh, yeah, I wanted to, I, I guess, to try to get my point across a little bit better, uh, there was a tweet I it recently put up. The, another heuristic to try out. Everyone except myself is a byproduct of their environment and circumstances. So the, this is kind of funny. Well, I don't know. It's taking a bit of determinism except for putting it on myself because there's kind of this thing that uh, human about human psychology where whenever other people do things that wrong us we tend to attribute um, intentionality to their actions so like say somebody's late for a meeting with us we and we might get angry and then assume that they were doing it just to spite us or to uh, just to get a reaction out of us something like that Whereas if the same exact phenomenon, I'm late to somebody else's meeting, I have excuses that I externalize towards uh, my environment. So, oh, my car didn't start, or uh, oh, my alarm clock was uh, wasn't loud enough, or, or something like that. That that's kind of like a common psychological tool that we use in order to benefit ourselves while also kind of detrimenting being detrimental towards others so this is i guess a heuristic uh, or a mindset to take about that i guess is somewhat akin to the secret where right. every, yeah uh, everyone else is deterministically driven and thus a product of their environment except for myself right where, but it sounds the desire here is mm -hmm. a counterbalance to a heuristic you already intuited right which is the statement that if it's for somebody else, then you're more likely to say that it's due yeah. to the ghost rather than the environment, right? Due to the ghost and the yeah. machine or due to the, themselves. However, uh, this does, it seems, right? Like, but uh, so then you would adopt that. But then this seems to be correlated with uh, personality. So depending on conscientiousness versus uh, and agreeableness. So one of the things when I was studying forgiveness, uh, or even for conscientiousness, right? Like someone who is low on conscientiousness, nothing is their fault. Everything's the environment's fault. Someone 100% on conscientiousness, everything is their fault. Even their starving kid in another continent is their fault, right? And then depending on your level of agreeableness is going to be dependent on how willing you are to forgive uh, someone else. So someone who is high on conscientiousness but low on agreeableness 
will then say to another person, that was your fault. You did not do what you needed, right? And whereas, and this also goes in with, you know, those, that image of the, uh, the, what would you call it? The CEO who walks past a person on the bum and says, get a job, right? Because it's then projecting uh, that their misfortune was due to their actions. Whereas someone who is more agreeable then will then be more, say, you know, give them five dollars in the belief that, uh, you know, their misfortune was due to societal forces. And you see this at the same time when a child was convicted. So several movies kind of deal with the topic or the subject of a child being uh, abducted for rape and murder. Uh, so one is The Shack. Uh, the other one is um, with Hugh Jackman and the other oh, guy. Oh, yeah, Prisoners. Prisoners, yeah, prisoners. right? Um, and there's also... Uh, so there's different things, right, which is, and you can see this, and another one is uh, Beautiful Boy. That's not a child being abducted, but it's a child being a school shooter. So you have different ways that these people deal with it, whereas with um, prisoners, the fathers do not, they would be high in conscientiousness, conscientiousness and low on agreeableness. That their child was abducted. That is their fault. They need to fix it. They cannot trust anyone else to fix it. They will take the matter in their own hands, right? Whereas the shack, yep. Yeah, go ahead. Where so, but in so you know in that movie it worked out like fortunately for them. But you can imagine times where vigilante justice did not work out. Right. And that's one of the ploys that happens in that movie, which is you're wondering, wait, did they like, you know, the the costs get more severe as the movie goes. And you're always like on the edge of the seat. Wait, is it going to work out? Is it not going to work out? Like, you know, did they, uh, you know, are the costs they're doing justified? And another movie that deals with that about justified costs is the movie Irreversible, which is like a five out of five. Uh, movie um so in that movie uh you witness something absolutely horrific in the first five minutes and you think how on earth could anyone ever be justified to do that and then the movie reveals a little bit more and more and more and then by the end you think how could anyone not be justified to do what they did Right. So it kind of plays on that. And so whereas the movie The Shack, then, you know, you it, it kind of did a different twist, which is there's nothing that that father could have done. And now mm -hmm. it's only time for him to forgive. And people who are high on conscientiousness and low on, uh, on agreeableness, they have a very hard time with forgiveness. Um, because... Whereas people who are higher on agreeableness than, and lower on conscientiousness, then they're going to have a much easier time to forgive, which is interesting. Yeah, I wanted to bring up that because the distinction between the shack and prisoners is that uh, in the shack, the man's child is already killed. Whereas in prisoners, that the, the life of the child, whether or not they're alive, is still up in the air. It's still uncertain. And, um, yeah. I, I think that's, but you can see the, the, the difference mm -hmm. here with the genders, right. Which is the, you know, the trust placed into it, which is the men are more exhibiting those traits. So in it, like there is like, how would the parents of, uh, in the, in the movie prisoners, how would the men have reacted if they did see the body of the girl, right? But even yeah. in the shack, I think that they never found the body, right? Like they just found the crime scene, but they didn't find the body. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. All right. So it's like you have the female in the shack, and that's one of the costs that were proclaimed in the shack that was, and they didn't go into this in prisoners, but in the movie The Shack, it was his inability to forgive may cost him his marriage and his remaining relationship with his remaining children. Um, 
And so then it's like that cost benefit, which is, you know, the wife is kind of desiring to move on. Uh, whereas the man in that needs some type of guidance beyond his intuitions to allow him to accept what happened to then, you know, be responsible for what he still has. And so in that movie, they invoke God uh, for it. And, but, you know, a lot of the beliefs, uh, you know, God still is a very good answer to. So for instance, um, like what to do in a marriage where one is, uh, when one of the partners is infertile, right? Because you've removed secular reasons then for marriage, um, which would be reproduction. So you need some type of social heuristic or some type of social strategy to, uh, to know how to act in that situation. And that's where religion uh, has fulfilled the role of an ethic within a community around telosses that uh, everyone has ascribed to. Uh, so, however, with the fall of the supernatural side of religion, then, you know, they, and with also we see this through the rise of Peterson, which is that a lot of religious behavior was actually based on firm strategies and good strategies. Uh, for dealing with a lot of suffering. And just because, and again, this seems to be like the fallacy fallacy, which is just because the reasons that, you know, our religion provided for a strategy are insufficient doesn't mean that the strategy itself is insufficient, right? Mm. So um, so that's the, the, the thing there, yeah. Yeah, there's a quote that I like something it goes something like uh it, if a theory is stupid but it works then it's not a stupid theory <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um but i mean so this is one of the things so it's going to be quite hard because i feel as well these authors they don't go far enough with the implications of their own theories and i think it's also because i guess the scientists instead of philosophers uh, they know the science, they know the domain of the science, and scientists generally stay within their area of expertise, but sometimes they feel that they're arrogant and audacious enough to, to comment on completely other areas because they are all focused on uh, inconsistencies. But it seems in more philosophical areas, then they don't particularly do so well. So, for instance, there was a point in... Uh, in uh, this book where, I don't know, in just like one little quip, uh, he, uh, Pinker kind of rules out Nietzsche uh, as just a blank slater. And it's just like, what? Like, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? Like, yeah, so let me see yeah. if I can find the exact quote because it seems like, how do we spell Nietzsche? I can never spell it. N-I-E-T-Z. S C H E. It's one of those words I write so often. That you just have to like it's almost like muscle memory into me now. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to go into uh, I, I guess a, a secondary like reasoning behind what I was talking about earlier about yeah. placing internal locus of responsibility rather than externalizing that responsibility onto others. Uh, and I and my reasoning for that is that. I have no control over what other people do. I mean, I, I can influence them in certain ways. Like I can try to reason with them. I can try to incentivize them through uh, reward systems and different things like that. But I, at the end of the day, I cannot actually control their actions, at, at least to a sufficient degree of placing all of my trust with it. Whereas my own actions, I can place a high degree of trust with it. You, with certain limitations as well like there's these always kind of exist along a scale like i i can't trust myself to do certain things so i i'll avoid that uh situation different things like that but it, anyway it because well, of the fact that yeah 
Well, that's one of the interesting things about the blank slate, right? Which is if one believes in the blank slate, and if they believe in that, then it's to say, and this is probably why Pinker argues the solution to nihilism is to trust your intuitions. But he doesn't take that far enough, right? But he would then, it seems like what he's reacting to is the idea that those who propose the blank slate, they can't trust any of their intuitions at all because their intuitions are, are demons from society, right? So therefore they subscribe to an ideology or previously yep. it was a religion yep. as that religion is the be all and end all for their morality and anything that violates that is, is um, repugnant or, or sorry, is um, sacrilegious. Yeah, and I definitely, yeah, definitely can uh, understand why the adoption of the, well, okay. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about how in regards to, um, what is it, imposed marriages, what was the term? You just, you were just talking about it earlier, but where, where the parents actually make the, the arranged marriage. So, yeah, arranged marriage. In those instances where, like, you might be biologically driven towards, uh, like, fall in love with somebody that just has a certain uh, aesthetic quality to themselves that is overtaking your ability to actually do any sort of, like, financial reasoning or, like, uh, craziness assessments, anything like that, to the point that if you were to get married just from your own basic, like, placing all chips on your own intuitions about uh which mate is uh the best bet to put to to uh to uh marry then you're limiting yourself to a more objective or i guess the better perspectives from other people so this is kind of what we've brought, talked about before with um uh, Romeo and Juliet where the love and the passion that both Romeo and Juliet had was enough to get two families uh, in a turf war in it and end up killing both Romeo and Juliet just because of their own passions uh, kind of igniting all this highly contentious uh, battle between families. Um, anyway, well, okay, the, yeah, the blank slate. And then, yeah, what I was talking about, how... Um, the locus of control but like my my decisions for actions are based or no, no no my reasonings for actions are based upon what i'm capable of acting out whereas i can okay so th this goes into a different tweet that i had that is just kind of throwing things out there and see just kind of what's on my mind at the moment but yeah uh also all, <clears throat> All moral statements ought to be rephrased to mean, here's what I, the speaker, shall do in the event that this does or does not take place. In order to, that's just kind of stepping away from the assertion of objective morality, kind of taking a Nietzschean position, which is, I, I guess, sort of not ironic, or I guess maybe somewhat hypocritical coming from somebody with theistic beliefs and, and assumptions of some sort of objective morality. But I, under the realization that just by me asserting that there's an objective morality has no uh, actual effectiveness in, in guiding other people's actions in, in what yeah. they're doing. So, like, I might have the assumption that is it is morally wrong to commit uh, abortions, but just me saying, hey, it's morally wrong to commit abortions, it's murder, uh, that doesn't do much to really persuade the other side at all so if if everybody kind of instead of just wearing their morals on their sleeves just by placating to their own uh, moral communities by saying hey taxation is theft that's kind of a moral um virtue signaling or, or something like that or or meat, meat is murder abortion is murder there's quite a few of these different kind of uh or, or uh, profit is theft that was something that uh, a communist recently uh, went into on a 
debate recently. But anyway, yeah, those are all just kind of like moral virtue signals rather than actually using our moral virtue signalings against each other in uh, discussions of politics. I think actually having discussions about like, okay, um, there are a certain degree of people that are, there's a certain amount of immigrants that are coming across the border. I can say that it's wrong for immigrants to come across the border, but that doesn't like have any moral weight to you who doesn't think it's wrong. Rather, I can say, okay, there are X amount of immigrants coming across the border. I'm going to do in my power is I'm going to hire more border security guards or, or something like that. Just that way we can get better discussions going where like they know what the outcomes are. And rather, plus a lot of the times, because people can just do these kind of moral virtue signalings without actually enacting any of their their virtues that they're actually supposed to be signaling. Like they can say that abortion is wrong, but yet they right. still so continue I, I, to uh, allow for it or, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, an example of this from the book is like Pinker, like Pinker's entire objection to certain things. Like, so what he gets right is he criticizes inconsistencies in other people. Great. And then he shows mm -hmm. consistencies in some new research. But every now and then, uh, Pinker becomes like this sanctimonious moral preacher uh, on things that completely are just intuited by his own secular ethic. So, for instance, one of these things, are his, what he's written is, Enlightened societies chose to ignore race, sex, and ethnicity in hiring, promotion, salary, school, admissions, and their criminal justice system because the alternative is morally repugnant. Right? We did these things because it's moral, just because us, like our enlightened societies, have a better moral sense or we more in tap with our own moral sense. Like, it's just like, what? come on like it just it just baffles me how he's just like like he doesn't and so again this is one of where he throws out Nietzsche under the bus so he's written but a funny thing happened to language in intellectual life rather than being appreciated for its ability to communicate thought it was condemned for its power to constrain thought famous quotations from two philosophers capture the anxiety we have to cease to think if we refuse to do it in the prison house of language, wrote Frederick Nietzsche. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world, wrote Ludwig Wittgen Wit Wittgenstein. Oh, yeah. Pinker, Pinker writes, how could language exert this stranglehold? It would if words and phrases were the medium of thought itself an idea that falls naturally out of the blink slate. And it's just like, what? You can't just go put these concepts in your blank slate box and then call them morally repugnant. It just brings to mind that clip of Peterson, where it's just like, we know what to do with right wingers. We put a box around them and then say, we're not allowing you to play anymore. And it's just the same thing. Like Pinker is just like, his intuitions seem to have guided him do you think the blank slate and all these things are morally repugnant? They're not enlightened, and therefore they're not worth consideration. And it's just like, but then it causes him to then throw out like the baby with the bathwater with that, which is, well, Nietzsche's correct. We can't think thoughts that we don't have a vocabulary to think. <laughs> like, <laughs> like yeah. you can't just throw that out as if it's, you know, it's, it's just, it just, it, it just baffles me right and this is like where so yeah so okay um i think i think for what you what you're trying to bring up we can integrate that into these discussions of the fear so for i don't know the fifth time uh for the uh inequality point right the fear around that just so i, I do it the justice because we keep rightly going on uh, tangents about it is so there's the idea that because in a uh if there is difference between like say male and female and they create different things then that could mean uh that 
certain injustices or you know that in certain injustices are correct however that's the fallacy which is then to say you can't just say it's correct um because it's natural you have to then look into whether or not it was actually correct and pinker just you know his only judgment of whether it was actually correct is based on moral senses however we know that that's not true and it's just obvious that that's not true and this is where like pinker doesn't like if he actually took like Nietzsche seriously he like this is where I feel and so my real contention with this book is he finishes it right on uh the quote let me pull up this last one um okay uh uh so oh right, so his last point is a final reflection Though I've emphasized the ways in which the blank slate is as relevant today as it was in 2002, it would be a closed mind indeed that did not change at all in more than a dozen years. So it's just to say like, okay, your book is just as relevant. The book that you wrote to build a bridge between the two camps is just as relevant today than it was when you wrote it in 2003. When it was published and it's just like how does this not bring contempt and shame upon yourself like if the if the problems are more relevant or equally relevant 16 years later for the what the book you wrote was meant to address then that is a overwhelming failure on your behalf to address the problems <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe it's because he wrote it he wrote it too too big of a book, and like not a lot of people read anymore. <laughs> I mean, he should have made it a YouTube video or TV show. <laughs> but I mean, like you know, his arguments have been propagated by like the skeptic community online, yeah. and even then, like there's just insufficient. Like you know, you can't just throw out Nietzsche as a blank slater because you find blank slating morally repugnant because it isn't of your enlightened taste. Like, no, that argument isn't going to fly with those people. Yeah. And it's not going to, as well, you're also not doing anything to then listen to the arguments of the old writer to take into those accounts. Or even, like, for even people of the evolutionary biology, like the evolutionary synthesis perspective or the multi-level selection. Like, at the end of the day, his whole book are like, there's these fears, I had them, I guess, as, well, like, so... I guess Pinker had them, which is why he can write with authority on these, and these are the solutions to those fears he had. But yet, he doesn't go any further than to think that, um, you know, his intuitions are actually at fault here, which is, like, his counter to uh, Nietzsche back with that quote was, like, like, there wasn't really a counter of that besides just to say, this is blank slate. And it's just like, no, like that doesn't counter it by just name calling it. And like he did this like all through the book by calling certain things fallacies. And it's just like just calling it a fallacy doesn't mean that its conclusions were incorrect. Like his conclusions could still be right, even though the logic to get there was wrong. And it's just like, it just shits me like so much with this book. So we have the fear of imperfectibility right which is then this desire of you know we can have perfect harmony right but then of course right then that can manifest as toxic harmony where you overemphasize harmony to the point where it's a problem right where you overemphasize harmony where you're not prepared to deal with unforeseen problems or where you know a yeah, so this is also the evolutionary reason why psychopaths exist. Because psychopaths exploit uh, harmony, essentially. Everyone's operating harmoniously. Therefore, the cheater can exploit it. Because they don't have defenses against the cheater. And by the and the social evolutionary, like the group selection thing. of the, So you can say, okay, well, the psychopath is going to win. Right, the psychopath genes propagate from an individual selection view because in times of 
uh, harmony, then they can win the game by playing by rules that other people aren't winning. But then you, the society adapts to outruling that particular niche. But again, the, so the social uh, selection strategy of, of psychopathy is that by if a society has psychopaths within it, then that society is forced to implore defenses against those threats. If a society did not have psychopathy within it, then the society, then if an external threat came, then they wouldn't have defenses against the same things that a psychopath would have exploited. So you can think of this in terms of, uh, like, say, assassination, right? So, you know, psychopaths could want to assassinate those in power to claim that power for themselves or whatever, right? So if the psychopaths within the kingdom, then the kings have to be really good at defending themselves against the threat of assassination. Whereas a society that didn't have such internal threats, then they would be open, then, you know, an external uh, psychopath could just rock up and kill the king very quickly. And that's like one example. And the other aspect of this of why the individual selectionists keep ruling out is, say, in the case of psychopathy, is, well, you know, it's not, you, know, you could probably say it's a byproduct or whatever. But then you would then you would think that a nation which didn't have psychopaths in it, which purged them all, would then be able to overthrow a nation that did have psychopaths within it, right? And therefore the gene of psychopathy would fall out, right? But no, we see the genes propagate because they they have some type of advantageous, otherwise they would be bred out. Um so, okay, so the fear of imperfectibility is then to say, you know, this desire of perfect harmony. But then again, it's like, this is where I fear, like, feel that Pinker, like, it doesn't require that much, like, it doesn't require 20 pages or so of text to then say, yeah, in, like, harmony can be toxic. Like, you can argue that in a few paragraphs. Same with determinism, right? It's just like, you know, he says the fear of determinism, which is if one believes, uh, so the fear is, is that if nature, uh, if we evacuate the ghost from the machine, right? So if we say that nature influences our conscience, like our, our, our biology influences our consciousness, then it means that we are now a victim to a consciousness and there goes free will. But it's just like, come on, you don't need 20 pages to argue this you can do it very easily which is that regardless of whether or not nature uh, influences your conscience or whether your conscience influences your nature you still have your choices in life still impact things right and you can then say oh well maybe you weren't really choosing but you know it's just your nature choosing but so what? Like, it doesn't matter on based on the actions, right? If you just believe your nature chooses, then you're sacrificing the concept of agency. But because we can ad adopt the concept of agency rather than uh, not adopting it, then it means that, hey, we have some degree of exercising the ghost over the machine, right? Because we have this ability to influence choice, if that makes sense. I think my internet must be spotty because you've been kind of cutting out in and out for that whole thing. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if cause I, I don't think I'll be able to really participate any. Oh uh, no! Okay. Discussion. Wait. Let's see then if it's you or whether it's the stream. Um. Do you want to go to the YouTube link for this? Oh yeah, yeah. And then. Just yeah, check just... whether you hear it. Down. You want to... Like, no, that argument isn't going to fly with those. Your selectionists keep pulling out is saying the case of psychology. You know, it's not... You, you could probably say it's a byproduct or whatever, but then you would then you would think that a nation which didn't... Yeah, it looks like in the stream there is some cutting out from your end. Oh, no. I mean, most of the time we were able to get, like, it, it was only, like, real short bursts that we were still able to get through the 
All right, let me turn my video off. Uh, yeah. And let's let's unplug some monitors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, oh, damn it. All right, but I have a local recording, so if the okay. um, if if it turned out to be a real issue, I just replace the video with the local recording. Oh. Okay. Um. All right, and let's close this. Okay. Yeah. So. The psychopathy thing, then, uh, just to reiterate, uh, if it was just based on an individual selection, then societies that didn't have that individual selection would have... Actually, let me re-enable the video, just because I suspect it was probably just due to all the monitors involved, because um, I recently got some money, so I upgraded my work working space. <laughs> Why would having more monitors... Just CPU your usage. Bandwidth? I don't think it's related to internet. I think it's related to my CPU because my fans like going insane. All right, I'll put, I put my bandwidth on very low. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so yeah, so the individual selection theory doesn't say why uh, psychopathy is there in every single uh, society nearly, right? Like Because then you would think that if something was undesirable uh, at an individual level, then societies that purge that uh, genome out of existence would then fare better, right? So then you would see clear mm -hmm. distinguishments between societies. But if something is true in all different societies, then it would then say that, um, uh, or even just in some societies, then when it would show that it's a beneficial trait in those environments which those societies operate. Um, All right, so and, I think I, I get what you're saying. So, like, where, like, okay, new or new types of societies where these types, uh, where where strategies that were failures prior to now are now going to be successful. Let's say, let's say altruistic, like you, the society you exist now within is one where you could be entirely altruistic and. It would only be beneficial for you. Let's say there's some sort of like social credit system or something like that, where anything you want can be garnered by being as altruistic as possible. This is a, an environment that is entirely new to all of our ev evolutionary history, and so this would not be an evolved trait, but rather a adaptation from the environment itself, or, or it's not really an adaptation, but a well, you could a, just a consider it a, a new strategy that was not that had no evolutionary predecessor. Yeah, well, it's it's just mimetic evolution, then, right? Which is to, I mean, again, that society is only thriving because it's dealing with environmental pressures better than other societies, right? And those specific environmental pressures that affect that society. So uh, as long as their genetic and mimetic uh, strategies align with the environmental pressures, then they will do fine. However, if environmental pressures change, then they need to be quick to adapt very, like, very quickly or a large portion of the population which don't have mutations, either mimetic or genetic, to then deal with the particular environmental threat will be perished. Um, so, th again, this is the evolutionary reason why there is even liberalism and conservatism. Uh, so we talked about the gender differences before, but those are gender differences where there's also political differences. So, for instance, it does not make sense for, you know, say in a tribe when there is now a plague and a shortage of food, right? Mm -hmm. uh, You're so still coming out. I mean. You're still... Um, I don't know what else I can do, really. Like I've got, I've got my CPU usage is normal. Let me just go. Is it better when I turn video completely off? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it sounds better. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, you're going into saying? the gender differences and the all oh, right, yeah, like so political differences, over. right? So Pearson raises this uh, in his personality series, I think, which is that uh, you have the so a famine ensures there's not enough food to go around. You now have to explore for new food, right? 
a conservative temperament is going to say we should only eat the food that we know is safe. A liberal mm-hmm. temperament will then say let's eat all the different foods and find out what works. But liberalism will die. Uh, uh, yeah. Most of them will die, right? So, you know, say with mushrooms, which is some mushrooms are edible and some mushrooms kill you. Um, and so, you know, if everyone ate, you know, if, so it, it makes sense that there is like, and this is one of the shortcomings, I think, with a lot of the thinking on this, which is it's kind of like an all for nothing type idea rather than this idea of counterbalancing which is that both strategies counterbalance each other and therefore they can both be adaptive strategies at the same time, even though they are different. And just whereas, so long, yeah, okay. So this yeah. is interesting. And it also brings into your group level select where even though these uh, might be adaptive, uh, like from an individual perspective, they are, it's a binary, it's either going to be adaptive or maladaptive where like if a liberal uh explorer goes out and finds some berries and they eat it this is and they die from it that's a maladaptive trait whereas when that person exists within a community of people that witness them eating the berries and then dying this serves as a group level adaptive recognition like the the very death of that person from eating the berries contains crucial information for the survival of that group now of don't eat those berries. Yeah, Even it's though, like a, a, a mimetic immune response for yeah. the society. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, a mimetic antibody, right? <laughs> um, so... But, uh, but I mean, we even see this uh, in situations of why men don't lactate, right? Which is, you know, if we believe there was a universal nature, then we would think that men should be able to at least lactate to facilitate child rearing adequately. Is that we don't see that, right? And the only evolutionary pressure that would see that is if women were as disposable as males. <laughs> Like we don't see, like say for instance, if war often involved with 90% of the females being killed and then most men being around, then we would expect that, uh, you know, and then there's being an overwhelming amount of young children uh, running around, like young babies, then we would expect that the men should be able to lactate to take care of them. Um, however, uh, what we, however, it, it just doesn't fit because you know, the situations are expressed where, uh, you know, women can fulfill the masculine roles, not superbly uh, based on the temperament. So if you have someone who has feminine temperaments, uh, like aperitures are optimized around that, and then for them to engage with a masculine role, that's going to be quite hard, uh, not for just biological, but also temperamental or social reasons because their minds are orientated towards different ends. Whereas, however, it's still possible. They can still manifest that. Whereas, you know, in the transgender community, you could have a female who has a hyper-masculine mind. Uh, this is the argument. And therefore, they can they would be better suited by adopting the masculine gender. So, you know, there is this flexibility, but, you know, it's still, there is a suboptimal on the general average. So, uh, you know, if the majority of men, you know, had to protect the women and they died or they had to go out to the unknown to, you know, again, protect this precious resource of long term uh, child bearing and child rearing, then uh, it would make sense that men are disposable and they won't be at home. And therefore, women have to pick up uh, the slack of the men every now and then, whereas the uh, there's never going to really be a shortage of women where the men somehow have to figure out how to pick up that slack because everything from mimetic to genes is orientated to prevent that from happening. Because if that happened, that would be one of the worst social and genetic disasters of the entire world, which is you would have a thousand, you know, or even a few million men, uh, you know, depending on the society, like 90% of the men of society fighting over 10% of women. And it's just like, this is, this is not a, a, a good strategy for productivity. You'll end up with men 
uh, doing gladiator contests to eliminate each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so okay, so yeah, so the fear of determinism is just this idea that. Um, uh, let me pull up my aura notes. Let's see if I wrote it down. Um, chapter ten. Okay, yeah. So I didn't write down the specific notes, but yeah. So the fear of determinism pretty much breaks down to that if we exercise the ghost from the machine, then the machine rules over our conscience and we abandon free will. But no, agency still is a choice we can elect to and it impacts our decisions and that is what the law is based on and even still like this is where pinker argues that you know for cap for punishment we do punishment not so much to uh, solve crimes that have already happened but to deter future crimes so we create costs to the benefit of committing things that you know in in my words would be uh, disadvantageous to the social strategy so we create costs to incent to create uh, a normativeness towards a particular ethos. Um, so, uh, however, then Pinker, for some reason, in the last half of that chapter, starts arguing, well, if someone can't understand what they did wrong, then we lessen the punishment. As an enlightened society, they shouldn't have a punishment if they don't know what they did wrong. And then it's just like, what are you talking about, Pinka? Because that goes like completely against what he just said earlier. And I, yeah, there is a silver lining here, which is, you know, if someone uh, like, you know, so he talks about the plea of insanity and whatnot, right? And then, but then he talks about the abuse of the plea of insanity. And it's just like, you can't, you can't just do these ultimatums. It's like, it just seems like, Pinker would benefit very much from moderation. <laughs> like, you know, like my, my mom, she always says the staple of anything in moderation is okay. For most things in moderation, that's okay. <laughs> There's a few things yeah. where that is not okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, yeah so the, um, uh, so like, again, so, for instance, uh, the age of consent is a good example of this, right? And different things. We children have less agency in the West because we accept that they haven't developed independence yet, uh, and then we do this age of adulthood as this time when they have now developed independence, where we now consider them the to have the sufficient social strategies in place to be responsible of their individual, uh, so their person. And therefore, you know, if they then commit a crime, we can punish them. But if a child commits a crime because they have reduced agency, we then do more adaptive punishments for them. But for adults, we generally do equal punishment to the extent of the crime. Now, if someone pleads insanity, then it's just like one, like, so it seemed like Pinker's argument was if someone commits murder, but they don't realize they did it, then they should be let off from the crime. And it's just like, okay, sure. They may be let off from the crime of murder, but they're still going to be held on the charge of manslaughter. Right? Like, like because we still have a legal system to deter such acts as against the social strategy. And it's just like, like this is where some of the inconsistencies just really play out. And then we have then the fear of nihilism, which is then to say that, well, if biology ruled everything, then there's no reason to, um, like, if we abandoned those three concepts, then biology could rule everything, in which case, well, everything's equal. There's no point in adapting society. Uh, we just let everyone do, you know, what their intuitions guide them. But then his argument against that is just to listen to your moral sense as if Pinker's concept is that everyone has this moral sense that will, if only through, um, I don't know, removal of bad theories, will end up becoming this uniform utopia. Like this, it's yeah. just like if everyone had the same information, they would all agree. And it's just like, no, Pinker, that's not the case. And also kind of under the assumption that, or without the realization that people can have a toxic amount of empathy when it is actually getting in the way of uh, allowing okay. so toxic empathy in that it protects 
uh, individuals from ever experiencing something that can that they can grow from that experience. So like um, keeping children that show a mild form of uh, an allergic reaction to peanuts away from peanuts from a young age will actually heighten that uh, allergy to peanuts to the point that they can't actually be in the same room as a peanut, which is something. Yeah. Yeah, it's just crazy that amount of uh, protectionism to- towards the, the weak that, that can take place with too much of a degree of empathy. Yeah, so Peter, uh, pin- yeah, sorry. Yeah, so Pinker writes. Uh, okay, what is it? Okay, I won't go into the details, but it's just um, so one of the notes that I've written is. Um, Punishment's a negative reinforcement of things that society wishes to move people away from, even if the plight was understandable. It is that exact understanding that is considered undesirable, hence why the law exists, as is the case with rape. We can understand the motivations. That is precisely why we punish it, as the individual motivations do not outweigh the social motivations. So, so the fear here is kind of like, if we can understand the motivations for rape, then we therefore condone it or we can't punish it. But no, we can still punish it because we have to develop social strategies and therefore we punish behavior that is, is, isn't aligned in the social strategies. And this is again why I think like Pinker failed to build a bridge because he's pretty much saying everyone needs to adopt uh, you know, he talks about the power of these social strategies. Like, so for instance, his know thyself area, right? So there's chapter 16, which is uh, about politics. But the whole thing is just him talking about liberals and conservatives and right wingers and left wingers. And it's just like, and pretty much the the takeaway of this is, yeah, politics should reflect reality, right? But then it's like, 50 pages all about that and it's just but the takeaway is just politics should reflect reality but he just talks about all these americanisms then we got chapter 17 which is about violence and it's just filled with all these americanisms but then it's just like yeah ignorance breeds violence i got it we we get it we can move on right and then we've got chapter 18 the gender and and i my note here is uh about yeah so then he's arguing um ah, let's see da, da, da. um okay so he's got this quote here which is the ongoing liberation of women after millennia of oppression is one of the greatest moral achievements of our species and i consider myself fortunate to have lived through some of its major victories and it's just like like it's just it's um his pussy heads really uh, going through. Yeah, and then, he, and then, yeah, directly after that, he says, the change in the status of women has several causes. One is the inexorable logic of the expanding moral circle, which has also led to the abolition of despotism, despotism, slavery, feudalism, and racial segregation. Another cause is the technological and economic progress that made it possible for couples to have sex and raise children without pitiless division of labor in which a mother had to devote every waking moment to keeping the children alive. And of course, the other major cause of women's progress is feminism, the political, literary, and academic movements that channel these advances into tangible changes in policies and attitudes. And it's just like, how, let's see what my note was. Um, Oh yeah, my note was just way to virtue signal. But it's just like, um, so the summary here is pretty much women's liberation was due to moral sensibilities, right? And that we've now upgraded our morals and that, you know, there was technological and economic progress. But like, this is the same thing where it's just, um, so, yeah, so he says, you know, it's due to the expanding moral circle, due to technological and economic progress and due to feminism, right? But then there's no unifying ultimate cause between these. Like there's no unifying system in this besides, you know, his answer to nihilism, which is this innate moral sense. And it's just like, this is where 
you know, he's just failed to get anyone who has read Nietzsche on board with this type of thinking. Because anyone who's read Nietzsche just realizes, like, you can't argue an intuited, intuited moral sense against another intuited moral sense. You mm -hmm. actually have to show how they're superior to each other. And yeah. this was something yeah. I, I got frustrated with during this conversation with Peterson, where uh, Peterson went, went into kind of the uh, the different politics or the uh, the different conservative and the liberal temperament, and then uh, Pinker went directly into kind of almost a a way to write off the conservative temperament was due to uh, an evolutionary history of, say, uh, a sense of disgust towards things that might be dangerous for towards the group. Under, uh, in a way, I don't know. And the way that he did it was such that, say, I don't know, kind of half hat, somewhat saying that this sense of disgust is no longer a useful tool for um, political consideration at all. Like kind of writing off the entire conservative party due to they have a adaptive trait in the past that can serve no purpose anymore because of, I guess, globalism. I, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure exactly, but I don't know. I, I see that with some of the other stuff that he does as well. Like there is, like if somebody w had wanted to, like, I mean, sure, there's an evolutionary history towards uh liberalism as well like the kind of female temperament of protecting those that uh, are too weak to defend themselves that's a uh evolutionarily adaptive uh temperament that has come about but that's not to say that okay we've reached such a point now that uh through capitalism like if i was a you know, ultra hard conservative through the 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 system of capitalism, anyone that is too weak to uh, take care of themselves can, can just move, uh, can take on a strategy that will be uh, economically viable for them in, in, into the future. Like, okay, say you're crippled, you can make a YouTube account. And there you go. There's an avenue for you to grow and sustain yourself. There's no longer this need for a liberal temperament or anything like that i mean that i'm not making that argument i'm just saying that it, no. it's it's very it's, it's, a, there's, it's a there's dishonest sense of, tactic to dismiss your opponents no. uh, th since he's not using it uh, or considering the implications fully upon his own yeah opinion. and it's just this like short-sighted uh self-righteousness right and where it's like this is one of the things that seems to be the case with pinker and it's just like, it just shits me, like, you know, his terms about, you know, our enlightened society, that is something that he says, right? And it's just sure. like, you know, morally repugnant. And again, like, just for this point about the, the liberation of women, he says just before that, it was not so long ago that women were seen fit as only to be housewives, mothers, and sexual partners, and were discouraged from entering the professions because they would be taking the place of a man. And we're routinely subjected to discrimination, condescension, and sexual extortion. The ongoing liberation of women after millennia of oppression is one of the great moral achievements of our species. You know, and you're like, wait, wait, wait. Like, this goes both ways. Men were subjected to work horrendously physical jobs and to not really see the children and to die to protect the society. They were there to protect women. Right, because women couldn't protect themselves against brutes. And then secondly, because women also were inundated with pregnancy. It was either never have sex ever, which then is is say, I could be an independent woman and not have sex, but then you're prone to rape, right? Or it's to say I will enter into a marriage and be protected by my husband and also bear children, something that most women generally like to do at some point in their lives, and then in which case, well, who's going to stay home and who's going to work in a society that is industrialized, right? Is it going to be the man that works in the, in the mines or in the factories or in the fields or whatever it is, or is it going to be the woman, 
right? And it doesn't make sense because the economic outputs of the man in those stressful physical jobs is going to be higher. Secondly, it is unbelievably immoral to have women competing with men in physical jobs which they cannot compete because they will be left behind and hurt. And secondly, especially if they're pregnant because they will miscarry. And also, the issue there is they also menstruate once a week, a month, right? So you're also going to have to deal with that issue on the workplace. And it's just like, it's just to consider this to be like oppression against women for men is such a virtue signal on Peterson's, on, sorry, on Pika's stance. And it's just such blindsidedness. It's just like this type of moral superiority, this self-righteousness that is within the left without like, it just shits me. And like his entire argument about this is about moral sensibilities. And it's just like, this has nothing to do with moral sensibilities. All those things you just caused is great emancipation of women, right? This was caused because finally, for the first time ever, men didn't need to protect women because we developed a state that could do so somewhat reasonably. Because we developed contraceptives so they wouldn't get pregnant. Because of all those things, the economics come first and then the moral sensibilities come. You would not see a woman who is pregnant saying, hey, I want to work in the fields. I want to work in the mines. In the, what is it? The, the what's the George Orwell's book? The uh, Wigan yeah. Pier. I want to work in Wigan Pier. No. No, <laughs> that is horrendous. And we see this as well with like Russia. Like Russia, even today, has a no women allowed in Antarctica policy because Antarctica is fierce and it is horrible and it requires it, every be, single person there to be strong. Yeah, a Antarctica is the South Pole. It would be the Arctic up there. No, no, Russia. the Antarctica. They have a base on Antarctica. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's like I just it just oh, it just there's not words to describe how much this self righteousness shits me. It's just mm -hmm. and the whole argument of it is like it just seems my genes <laughs> are more self righteous than your genes. Like it just shits me. It's like, yeah. like, because liberalism is now everywhere, it is superior to you peasants. And it's just like, oh. yeah. yeah, that's kind of the thing, too, because in order for there to be morality, there has to be a, well, I don't know, there kind of has to be a, a, the ability of free will or something like that. Like, it even the concept of, as Nietzsche has pointed out, the, the concept of morality is something that is only within the religious framework. And so it, it, it's, it, it's just the, the sign of an incons inconsistent thinker to still hold to there being moral progress and things like that, while also still being sort of a uh, determinist in regards to there is no free will, there is no uh individual ghosts in the machine or anything like that it's yeah 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 so then like yeah this is when so for instance this type of inconsistency is not just in these later chapters it is throughout the entire book like <laughs> this is and it's 512 pages long so you just have to like deal with Pinka, like being the sanctum, like it's so annoying because everything he criticizes in his opponents, he does himself. And he rules out his policies as committing, like his opponents as just committing fallacies. And then he just, his arguments against them is, we are more enlightened. And it's just like, ah, it's just like, just because your opponents were inconsistent does not mean that you're somehow smarter and superior to them. Like, like, you know, just because they're inconsistent doesn't mean that you're magically consistent. Like, you also have to be consistent too, Pinker. Alrighty. Um, so chapter 19 was about children. 
Uh, and it was pretty much that, yeah, with children, nature and nurture have effects. This is like where he raised the identical twin stuff. And she was like, okay, fair enough. We probably didn't need another 50 pages on that, but fair enough. Okay, the arts. So he writes um, that, uh, so he starts off, and this is the other thing that is exemplary of Pinker's conversational style. So you'll write, the arts are in trouble. I didn't say it, they did. The critics, scholars, and as we now say, content providers who make the living in the arts and humanities. One cause of the decline in academia is competition from the efflorescence of science and engineering. In this chapter, I will diagnose the malaise of the arts and humanities and offer some suggestions for revitalizing them. Then in the next subchapter, he says, as a matter of fact, the arts and humanities are not in trouble. Yeah, it's just like, just like, it seems like it's part of his argumentational style to like fully embolden and carry the torch of the belief he disagrees with as if it is true and his own belief. And then in the next chapter, just started off with, yeah, everything I just previously said, I think it's shit, right? And it's just like, because then it kind of allows him, I guess, this type of, you know, wishy-washy, I can say whatever I want, uh, because then it's just like, hey, I can always just say I was just making an example of something. But it should be like, no, just call it out on bullshit when you call it, like, when you say it's there. Like, and this is where he, like, starts using, like, I language. And again, and it just kind of uh, really shits me. So the takeaway of this chapter for another 50 pages or so is pretty much art is crap because it became benign. It needs to get back to its roots and become meaningful again. And that art has, and that art that has been doing that already is doing well. So that's pretty much where that 50 chapters are, right? Um, okay, chapter, uh, then the last bit, uh, placating the blank slate's departure and afterwards, the blank slate was a success. It allowed me to sell more books. <laughs> it is more relevant today than it was then. It's just like, this seems to be an admission you sold nothing, Pinker. <laughs> like, like, so this is, yeah, so let's let's dive into this where it can actually go so much further. So um, I share like a long rant um, in the group chat that maybe I'll see if I can say it. Okay, da da da. Um, okay, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, so from a follow-on from our discussion in the last book, um, I wrote for that because um, for so the for the rape, uh, the natural history of rape book, I've written the shortcoming of the book is it expresses in the last third about adopting social strategies that would be better at mediating the competing male female sexual selection strategies, which naturally is adopt is adaptive strategies at the social group tribe and species level which naturally would cause group selection between groups that have better and worse social strategies. Selective pressure, natural pressure, also presses against the group unit, that is the social strategies that a tribe of humans have adopted. Individual selection is insufficient in explaining suicide, adoption, infertility, and selection between groups that deal with them better. Groups that fail to overcome individual shortcomings through social strategy would be groups eliminated from the species. For instance, male adultery occurs when the male sexual selection strategy in a relationship is running at a deficit to its potential. Affairs may occur when the male has excess of resources and a mateship opportunity. Extramarital rape may occur when he does not have that excess, but still has that deficit in meeting his sexual needs. Societies would be selected based on their adaptive ability in mediating this. Islam does it through men with excess with multiple wives. West mediates this generally through adultery and then divorce or through adoption. This subjects the nations to different fitness. Also, a preventative strategy can be achieved through no sex before marriage, prolonging hyperselective strategic non-sexual courtship, ensuring the best match that does away. 
Preventative strategies are compatible with favoring individual selection as it offers alignment. However, mediative strategies that mediate byproducts of individual strategy shortcomings are also prone to selection at the group level. The risk of group selection is that it can justify the natural fallacy that anything against individual selection may be a group selection, so don't mess with things, which causes a failure to act. That's hypothesis nihilism. However, that would then state the adoption, suicide, infertility are all just byproducts upon byproducts. That seems insufficient, as a society's strategies around those byproducts result in a society's success or failure against societal selective pressure. It also results in the risk of a fallacy at that level. The adoption, that adoption is maladaptive to adoptive parental genetic interests. Therefore, adoption should be eliminated which seems a risky move, as it's prescription that can only be tamed by forces beyond individual sexual selection. Hence, some balance of both with delicacy to avoid the naturalistic fallacy is required. So, um, yeah, so, da -da -da -da. so, okay, reading the chat, so again, this one is about Pinker's uh, book, uh, The Blank Slate, so I've written, Reading the chapters on the fears, it seems Pinker justifies the resistance to anti-blank slate ideas as stemming in fear. However, I think that is insufficient. Values cause those fears. The fears aren't shared by everyone. We know from Peterson's research that values and politics are driven by personality. We know from Helen Fisher's research that those are driven by hormones. We know that hormones are driven by genetics and race and are activated by environmental and biological cues such as gender and scarcity. I think that the large issue I have with this book is Pinker's failure to apply beyond good and evil to his own thinking. He projects his own revelations onto everyone and denounces anti his worldview easily. He is so quick to use misuse, evil, prejudice, enlightened, and all those words absolutely sincerely. I think it is because he, in his worldview, had those fears and understands those fears. Whereas the issue I'm having is I don't have any of those fears. Therefore, I had no need to think prejudice on their axioms and go into black and white uncritical thinking about them. However, getting back to values, it seems these fears are evolutionary fears that stem from the feminine perspective. One of the things I've recognized since reading the rape book is that men and women have some really essential ultimate causes. Women's short fertility window and the need to nurture drives them. Men's need to acquire resources to get the best mates and, if found, to provide for his children. However, more polygamous males, a different sexual evolutionary strategy that is in active competition, doesn't care for the latter. And rapists, another sexual strategy, doesn't care for neither. Men work like machines. Women nurture everything. In relationships, this causes contention, as women have the fears of inequality, imperfection, determinism, and eventually nihilism, as the ticking clock forces the fears upon them. Men, their ticking clock, is a ticking clock of accrued interest of their investments, a positive exponential graph, whereas for women, it's a time bomb. Women are desperate to be desired and seize as many resources as they can before the time bomb is up. Then after that, they demand respect and sympathy. Men are desperate to work to earn their place in the world or to kill themselves as a waste of space. Of course, these are the purest embodiments of those archetypes. In reality, we have feminine men and masculine women, as a counterbalance, it seems. However, now, perhaps less as a counterbalance and more as a maladaption to the modern environment, as we would have an excess of liberals in the world probably due to free healthcare and free medical cures, as they historically would have continually died off while the conservatives stayed safe. That is, the liberal explorative men would have died off as they would have engaged in high-risk behaviour, competing for women. The liberal explorative women, the liberal explorative woman would have been subjugated to the home, or at least to social conservative interventions, and had the temperaments constrained socially by a masculine vote. The excess of liberals could be good or bad for the modern global world. However, conservatives feel no place in this modern world, so feel Armageddon is coming. 
even though a liberal feel utopia is coming. This is a problem, as the world is not a liberal utopia. It is a world ruled by scarcity and nature. And it will be interesting to see what social selection gives into pressure, especially with tech feudalism on the way. However, liberals seem to like that, as they seem addicted to entertainment over self-reliance. And both parties seem addicted to comfort. That said, it would make sense evolutionarily why Peterson's followers are men who are thirsty for self-reliance and responsibility, as those are traits that active, that active, uh, what? That influence men positively. They use those traits to compete for female attention and to acquire resources for females and children as the ultimate cause, and as side effects to compete with other men and climb hierarchies. Whereas women's focus seems driven by fears to provide comfort and nurture and sympathy, or to some extent, stability. And with the perception of instability, they depend on men around them to protect them. And with the destruction of the family, that becomes the state. Hence movement instead of, hence the movement of instead of guns being in husband's hands, the guns go away into the state's hands. The omni present husband as the government. It's as if Pinker's worldview is artificially constrained, and he spends so many pages arguing things that are banal and mundane. It's as if one needs a textbook to realize why can't it be both things, or neither, or part, or partial. He just seems eager to get the two sides to agree, where his desire for agreement is clouding his own ability to think critically on his own positions where war is merely about superstitious beliefs rather than anything actually tangible. So I think that kind of drives it home because, you know, we know that, for instance, journalists are majorly women, and that makes sense, and they're specifically women of a left-leaning orientation, and same with academics. This makes complete sense from their value system, which is their value system is about reducing conflict and getting agreement. So if everyone had the belief there is if everyone had the same information, everyone would agree and we would avoid conflict. And this seems to be like Pinker's thing here, which is Pinker's is like, if I can get everyone to agree, we would avoid conflict here. But that type of intuition on Pinker's behalf seems to constrain him because it's saying, hey, your quest for agreement here is meaning is that you're just always wanting this type of self-righteous superiority, that it can't be two things at the same time, it could, can't be paradoxical, or there can't be multiple evolutionary strategies operating at the same time competitively. And it's like this, Peterson raised it well in terms of cooperation. So cooperation can come through collaboration or cooperation can come from competition. So for instance, any sport, people cooperate competitively against each other. Right, so you have two teams, they're collaborating with each other to compete against the other team, but it's only a game if everyone's playing by the same rules. They cooperate to play by the same rules, and someone who doesn't cooperate is ousted from that unit, even though competition is engaged and rewarded within. And it's just, and you know, you don't want competition when you want collaboration, because then, you know, the team is stronger as the team is able to be cohesive and collaborative. If there's just one star player, then the team is not going to be good. So the team has to be collaborative. However, you can have multiple teams playing the same cooperative game. Like you can have multiple nations that have trade agreements with each other. You can have multiple groups, that's fine. They can cooperate with each other. You don't need to assimilate everyone into the same environment. It just shits me. But could it could it be the case that like if nations are utilizing different rule sets, then when they come when they interact with each other, there's going to be conflict and necessarily competition and war. Then, like like as we brought up with the rape of Nanking, through the use of the UN, there kind of was this ability to abstract out any particular country as having moral authority over the other and kind of placing moral judgment upon the 
globalistic uh, ethics then. Yeah. Well, it, it only depends if they're... So, for instance, you know, you could have two different cultures, right? Like Islam versus Christianity is a good instance of this. But as long as they can find ways to trade, uh, then that's fine. It's when scarcity approaches and then one... It's like, so this is the thing. This is where agreeable people completely fail to understand the the justice of cruelty, which is that, hey, your family believes in these ethics, your tribe, your kin, whatever you want to call it, right? Believes in this ethos and this ethic, right? That tribe believes in a completely incompatible ethic, right? Let's say they believe pedophilia is okay and you don't, right? Uh Hold up, I, I need to fix my, my headphones have just run out of battery. Just give me one minute. Okay, yeah. I guess I have to talk now so that there's no hitting her. Uh, yeah, good talk so far. I, I think probably have to wrap it up fairly soon because we've been going for... Four and a half hours now. Yeah. Or uh, maybe about four hours, I think. All right. So you should be able to hear me fine. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Uh, yeah. So for this um, was the point. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about this several times in the group because it's such a obvious, uh, I shouldn't say obvious. It's obvious to some people. It's not obvious to other people, but it just comes up all the Time again, the reason cruelty exists is because there's reasons for it to exist. So, for instance, you know, that could be defensive aggression against some invader, right? But why are they invader? Why are they a problem? Why are they other? Well, they're other because they have a different ethic of what is applicable that is against our own ethic. Now, you know, to some extent, how much can that other become kin, right? Well, how much are they willing to adapt? Now, to some extent, they can adapt and assimilate, right? And to what extent should they assimilate or integrate? If they integrate, then we absorb their ethic into our own ethic. If they assimilate, then they abandon their ethic for our own. Now, for this, then that's fine. And, like, like you know, there's ways around that. The issue is when it comes to where two ethics separate, and then that causes uh, – and – and they're fighting over the same resources. You can see this in two children fighting over the same toy, or two nations fighting over the scarcity of food or resources. Um, uh, so, or for instance, you know, land. A nation can become overpopulated. They need food, or they need land, right? And then that will be a cause of war. And they can't just say, "Hey, can you give us some more land?" Because the nations will say, hey, you do these things. We don't like those things. Are you willing to compromise? And maybe sometimes they are willing to compromise and you have a treaty. Sometimes they're not and you have war. Right? And that's fine. That's, you know, that would make sense. That's the reason why, why we are still here today. Because we fought our gods with other gods and the best gods won. And now we're killing the gods and then replacing them with ideology, which seems to be a stupid idea to some extent. And it's only stupid when we just go haphazardly into it. Like we should come up with philosophies rather than ideologies. Um, and those philosophies should be humble. Um, so, yeah. And, and fluid enough to adapt to new environments. Yeah. Or new situations. I mean, the environment's going to stay the same. It's just how we. Um, well, yeah, there's always going to be new things yeah. to the environment. Yeah. But that's also the, like, you know, that's why the men can be, uh, why patriarchy can be an issue because it can, it optimizes for the current status quo. Whereas mm -hmm. this feminine creativity that Peterson talks about, then that's optimized for more of the unknown uh, in terms of, and this is going to be a quite a big contradiction, right? Because you think, hey, wait, isn't the men's meant to be the explorer in the unknown? So there's different, which is there's the masculine in terms of that which seizes resources from the unknown, this kind of patriarchal aggression, this masculine aggression. But then there's also, and then you have this feminine type of creativity. Uh, so creativity is kind of the divine mother, uh, this benevolent sister, this which gives 
uh, the you know you tap into the ether of Gaia, the the fertile soil, the uh, uh, egg of creation kind of thing, right? Whereas the uh, the frantical father or the 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 what's the other one? The hero uh, aspects of these, and these are things that kind of can tap into that. So there's always this duality, this kind of balance between the two. Like I mean, on the other side, you have the um, what is it? The terrible sister? Is that what it is? I can't remember. The you have the ben beneficial sister, the benevolent sister, and you have I think the I don't know. Let's just call it the terrible sister. So this can be like the mother bear, right? This can be the edible mother, that which constrains um, uh, in the ideas of like compassion or empathy, um, or that which takes um, uh, as well, like viciously. So. Uh, you know, men who are fully integrated, then they should be able to integrate this kind of feminine nature. And you see this in every single hero movie, which is great man, you know, an unknown dragon encroaches the land. Uh, you know, the this then propels the man onto a journey. The man then seeks and he discovers he's, you know, tries and explores, but he discovers he's inept. He, you know, builds a series of comrades to make up and cooperate and figure out where the strengths uniquely are. But then there's always a woman and that woman throws, don't become the thing you wish to eliminate by embracing tyranny. Also remember to love yourself and also to, you know, adopt this kind of creativity. Um, and then the, you know, man, you know, go, not only then does he have a reason to fight an ultimate cause to fight, now he has a woman to fight for. Uh, rather than just nihilism, then he fight uh, both yep. to fight for and also to risk dying for. That's the main thing. Because if he was only concerned about his own welfare, he wouldn't risk himself in, in a dangerous environment. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. So then that's the thing. Like that's why you know we see with the boy and the beast, like the role that the woman played, which is the and same with crime and punishment, which is the woman is this redemptive figure. And, you know, the so the society can become stale, which is its laws become stale and inefficient to deal with the unknown. So, but it hyper adapts to the current situation. And this is where this kind of balance plays in. So it's just like, you know, these fear, like, it's just so annoying because, you know, these thinkers, they just can't move, like, I guess it's just like they just throw out Nietzsche as if it's just blank slate. And it's just like you can't just throw out your opposition. You actually have to figure out, you know, like it just, you have to figure out what their arguments are and if their arguments are true and where they're true, what domain that they're true. But then it just seems like you have, you know, some men who are high on agreeableness and then they have their intuitions about what they want everyone to agree to. And then you have some, you know, more feminine people who are high on agreeableness who then also want, um, you know, want everyone to agree to their own compassionate things. And this is like kind of like the book. It's just to say, you know, these are my intuitions and your ones are wrong rather than ever saying, hey, why don't we just try and integrate all of this into a cohesive framework, which is, seems to be finally what the evolutionary synthesis proponents are doing. Except then they're getting, you know, then it violates the wishes of all the different camps. They're like, they get the, all the pitchforks because not only do they piss off the pinkers, they also piss off the uh, the blank slaters. Like they pick <laughs> off the skept, like the, 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 the pure individual, like the, what do you call it? The hard science nerds and they piss off the complete soft science uh, sociologists, right? Because, you know, the sociologists are holding on to the blank slate to then say, hey, this justifies our wish of a utopia. And then the hard science people are saying, ha, your utopia is foolish. Instead, it's like, you know, uh, what, what would be the wish of Pinker? It's more like, like, it's kind of just, it's, it's, I can't really identify the wish besides it's like this agreement for a secular type of, a yeah. godless society like do you know what i mean yeah yeah that seems to be it because uh, just from what you're discussing about it earlier he his usage of the enlightenment period as kind of the the 
the, uh, I guess, height of human civilization and all good things have grown from that period that, and, and for our future to become better, continue through its moral progress, we are to uh, return back to that type of thinking. That seems to be kind of his goal is to create the enlightenment kind of utopia for, or I, I don't want to attribute it to utopianism to it, but at least that ability to continue the moral progress that has occurred so far through the way that uh, of secularism and enlightenment and liberalism. Yeah. But it so seems like aimless and insufficient because like, you know, his answer to nihilism there, like he's not giving anyone anything to kind of combat one intuition against another besides playing the fallacy and consistency game. I, like he's not like you know to some extent he's saying like go to the science the science will reveal how they influence each other and you know like all of these reasonable things but it's just like you can do these reasonable things without being so dismissive of all the other arguments like without this moral superiority and it's just so, weird so here's something i was just kind of thinking about is maybe the, one of the problems with science as a worldview is that it is too, I guess, monocular, monar, monocular in its lens, where there's a single perspective on how to look at things. Whereas, as we've kind of brought up, there's the masculine and the feminine strategies for how we deal with life. And so it might be that, like, to hold the best feminine uh, strategy, you have to have a narrative that is associated with those intuitions to put, put into practice. And same for if, you, if you're you a man and you require a masculine strategy to hold society together, that way there's not too much feminine and not too much masculine. Then there has to be like two, I guess, cooperating narratives that are still uh, contradictory i guess if you want to look at it that way to each other because they they both are of two different varieties whereas with science it's if you like let, let's say you can turn the entire world into a, a a narrative of facts there's like all these facts about everything there's still no uh, I, I there's no specific narrative towards either masculine or feminine strategies and how to work within that that system of facts. I don't know. It's just something percolating at the moment. I'm not sure where where it'll go from there. Yeah, but I mean, like maybe at least in this case. Like, you know, that's one of the things I think is uh, it's easy to, like, it could just be, again, that Pinker, you know, went into academics, he saw all those things he called out on, which is, you know, there's a whole bunch of insane people who are spurting yeah. a lot of <laughs> contradictions. And he was like, I'm going to call this shit out. Like, it, 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 you know, and then he just, you know, his area isn't in philosophy or anything. He just, um, you know, He's got his own area in the uh, developmental language in children. But then it's just like, you know, and then he goes and writes this and then, you know, to call out the inconsistencies with his and mash it with his own intuitions at the time. And for some reason that props him to like, the, you know, the, the I don't know. So it's the same thing with the, like the intellectual dark web, where it's just like this little high school, like, chess club of like people who are like just on the outskirts but they're not really on the outskirts kind of thing and then you actually have like the disagreeable people actually doing disagreeable things which no one like will speak about <laughs> kind of thing and it's just like like the intellectual dark web like i don't understand in what conception they can be considered the intellectual dark web it's just like what you are is you're the the intellectual centrist of the overturn window like yep. way to go there <laughs> like, 
<laughs> well, that's the thing. I, I, I think you bring up a good point. Like, and this is like part of what my reasoning I gave for why I didn't bother trying to finish it was because this book was not directed at me as an audience member. I think this is this book was entirely directed towards the social uh, constructivist viewpoint that a lot of that is like current, still predominantly active within academia. Yeah. And so I think from that understanding, uh, you're spot on when you say that this book is a failure because the only people it managed to persuade are people outside of academia who, who are just kind of uh, con not contemptful, but are getting aggravated with the absurdism of leftist propaganda and the how they are tyrannical in how they run things. So like it this is this this book was highly effective for uh giving a reasonable justification for the the intuitions of people that it wasn't actually aimed at. It was like just for people like Sargon and uh Armored Skeptic, people like those uh online people that aren't actually in academia who could learn quite a bit or uh, who could actually benefit from changing their mindset. But, so yeah, that, that, while it was remained successful as a book, I, the problems of academia and blank slateism is still uh, quite prevalent. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same way of saying like, is PewDiePie successful? Right or any random YouTuber with a million subscribers, and just be like, "Sure, they're successful to the audience. Like they found an audience. Like way to go, thumbs up." But it's just like, like, are they successful in accomplishing, like integration with wider society? Like, what means are we judging them by? And like, it's the same thing where like he just writes this afterward to the 2016 edition, and it's just like, like. Like what? One of the th first things he says is uh, how it allowed him to sell his other book. Yeah, yeah. So he's like, not only do I see no contradiction between acknowledging the dark side of human nature and figuring out how to best overcome it, but I've explored it in depth and how our species has managed to do just that. In 2011, I expanded on the observations that ended the, in the violence chapter into one of the most optimistic books in recent memory. The better angels of our nature, why violence has declined. <laughs> to the spluttering bewilderment of the standard critics of evolutionary psychology, who allege that that approach rules out hopes for social improvement and justifies a reactionary fatalism. And then he finishes it with the, the book, The Blank Slate, is just as relevant today as it was back then. And it's just like, <laughs> well, well, way to go. I guess it caused personal success and then, you know, get some people to uh to be a lot more like, yeah, I guess, you know, like, like, because this whole thing like was, was, you know, these people are saying these contradictory things. Here's some science to disprove it. Here's my intuitions. Way to go me. And it'll be like, like, like just yeah. because other people had contradictions doesn't mean that your intuitions are correct and it's um and then also it's just like like yeah it just shits yeah you're me. you're right it's like similar to the idw there, there's a lot of basically just status quo warriorism it's just like what whatever we already know we're providing a good back like the better angels of our nature is just to is basically just that, like the position that we're at currently is the best it's ever been, and thus there's no need to worry about anything. But that's the thing, like everybody, like worry is one of the most motivating <laughs> factors for a lot of people. So like, there's all these people that are using our, uh, or uh, they're exploiting our worrying system in order to motivate action. And so like, that's the thing. If I feel like the world might end if I don't do something right now, then I'm going to actually start to do something. <laughs> but if I feel like, oh, things will take care of themselves, then, yeah, things will just continue to ha what they've been. Yeah. Yeah. 
it just it kind of shits me because I'm reading th- going through this appendix now, and it's just mm-hmm. like, like then he's he's kind of got bits on each chapter or at least some of the interesting chapters, and then he's saying like you know what's kind of happened. <laughs> like say for instance, chapter nineteen, children. This is my favorite chapter, and indeed one of my favorite things I've ever written. <laughs> it's just like, it was also, putting aside Summer's brohaha, the most controversial. Virtually all the objections came from the two misunderstandings that I grimly anticipated, despite, despite my having mustered every microgram of expository skill to forestall them. In my experience, no one understands that the second four laws of behavioral genetics are about, no matter how patiently they explain. Everyone confuses them with the first law. So it's pretty much like, again, just saying, you disagree with me because you're an idiot. <laughs> like, like, rather than saying, you disagree with me because what you're saying is probably true in this area and I am dismissing it. Like, it's just, just, I don't know. I mean, I can I I can probably rant on this, but I I feel like I'm risking over speed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We should probably try to wrap up pretty soon, but yeah. I, I think that I don't know. It just made me think about like how I think Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, is a much more effective book for our day and age because it directly is related to the problems that we face, uh, at least for for me in America, with a, a very divided split between politics. Uh, and and the people that we have, uh, or between politics dividing people, uh, and so that gave me a whole lot new lens for how to look at things, and also gave me strategies for changing how I look at things, so that hopefully uh, better uh, cooperation can take place between people of different intuitions right. and uh, values that they hold. You know what I think the contention is here? The secular skeptic community don't replace anything with a unifying narrative, right? Because they're not like, and that's the issue with them aborting social evolution or social strategies because they're so resistant to social strategies being, why I should say like, you know, say in this book, right? Like he calls out these you know these fundamental narratives of his opposition and he says these are based on these fears and then these are the small strategies we can use to adopt it but he doesn't replace uh you know it with something else to long for and that long for should be uh, as i said in like a tweet which is to have the best wishes which is have wishes that are aligned with reality and to revise your wishes accordingly it's because as soon as you have a wish that's against reality, you either have to choose to then be deluded or to uh, to adapt your wish. But I mean, like wishes are everything. Like people choose which company to work for because of wishes. People choose which mate to select because of wishes. People choose everything, like which product to buy because of wishes. And it's just like you need to make sure your wishes are aligned and you need to like that the like the unifying strategy that I think should come out of this is which doesn't seem anyone is adopting is, you know, like economic morality is a really good unifying strategy, which is to say, like, you know, it gives people and this is what my real hopes are with the book in two weeks. Hopefully the book next week can teach me something of why I'm wrong. But, you know, my hope for the book in two weeks is to be like, hey, some people have really thought this out and then been like, hey, this is a good strategy to move into the, the non-supernatural world with. This can be a religion that, you know, is an atheistic religion that isn't a, a deluded ideology. This is something yeah. that is adaptive and something that integrates opposition and can trade with opposition. So Yeah, because that's kind of the thing too, like it, always just so surprising why young people flock to communism and i think it's because there is that sort of narrative there where you you have a part to play in the revolution towards the utopia like every like everyone around you is miserable and so we know what can change that like make it so that people are no longer in misery 
and here's the steps to put into practice with it. Yeah. When I for Pinker, like to admit that social strategies are moral depending on their environmental outcomes would mean that his uh, perception of the liberation of women being this moral triumph of individuals, like of the liberals, right? Like the liberals won against those misogynistic chauvinists, right? Like all that becomes unearned because it just says you were just, you know, operating, like not entirely unearned, but like that type of supremacy is just like to say, you know, you were also just a cog in the ghost of the uh, the machine of society. And where it's less like, uh, you know, now society's pressures are pushing you to do those things. And I think that is very, very much antagonistic to many of the secular communities, where it's just like, you know, they view themselves as this, like, you know, they themselves are the ultimate cause, right? Where it's just like, I have the will and whatever. And then, um, but it's also, you know, from... Pinker, he's you know he argues against the ghosts of the machine, but it's still like this type like there's so much moral superiority throughout the book, and it's just like you know if you were to believe in social strategies, then it means that your moral superiority is not earned. It is just adaptive strategies, and what you should be focusing for is your ability to abide by those you know by the best strategies, like you know which is really what Peterson uh, espouses, even though. At times, you can, you know, falter on that, which is to say, you know, be willing to revise and be the hero and do the eye of horror story and, you know, revise yourself in the face of new information kind of stuff. And, you know, probably better than anyone else who's doing that uh, well. I mean, there's lots of criticisms directed to the guy, but, you know, at least for that bit of wisdom, he, he's right on. Yep. So. All right. All right. want to wrap up? Yeah, so uh, I, don't, I don't really have any announcements this week besides, you know, all that digital nomad stuff on the forum. Um, and But, yeah, other than that, we have these calls every week. You can all get all the details in the description. Been doing this for multiple years now. And, you know, feel free to join in. Like, we had Octavian join this week. This was his first session. So, you know, do, feel free to do the same. Join, ask us questions and all the rest. Um, and you know we're here to to learn and get the best strategies so uh yeah john do you have any shout outs you want to do uh no not really just want to confirm okay so next week will it'll be at this same time as before saturday yeah yeah we got uh, rid of that first meeting now there's only one meeting every week all right just make sure you're sleeping well enough right <laughs> yeah well I, well I went to bed at 7 p.m yesterday so i'm a lot more fresh today all right that's good yeah and, but and the book that we'll be discussing is uh, adapting minds evolutionary psychology and the persistent quest for human nature that's the one all right by david j buller all right cool i'll be looking into that yeah hopefully that one is uh gives us some things that that are a lot more antagonistic to ourselves <laughs> so you know uh, it'll be good alrighty uh, yeah so cheers everyone you can find all the details in the description thanks so much for joining let us know your feedback